Oh, I see. She printed them so portraits of the oh, landscape. Oh, so did she print new ones for everybody? Not for everybody, just two. Oh. Two oh. <laughs> okay. I already sat down. Good evening and welcome to the October 9th school board meeting. Please join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? No, nope, seeing none, okay. May I have a motion for approval of school board minutes? I move we approve the regular business meeting Tuesday, September 11th, 2018 minutes attached in our packets. I have a second? I second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Next, we have uh, comments from our student representatives. Um, so this week is Spirit Week at the high school, um, and so it's kind of a fun thing going on. Um, and our the junior class, which is our class, has been organizing it and um, putting a lot of work into it this year because um, one goal is to try to make it more inclusive and like make um, the whole or like have the whole student body kind of participate in it. Yeah. In the past, it's kind of been like the same group of kids who have gotten really excited about it. So we're really trying to include everyone throughout the school and really get them all excited about school pride and stuff like that to kind of lighten up everything. So I know school and academics sometimes get stressful. This is kind of a time for everyone to just 
enjoy <laughs> school as a whole. And also, um, tomorrow we have PSATs for freshmen through juniors. Um, so this is just a good opportunity for kids to see kind of where they're ranked so far and how they can improve that. And Khan Academy now is a good program where they'll take your PSAT scores and give you stuff to work on, um, which is a free program, which is extremely helpful. So, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> No. I think good that's luck. all we have today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good luck tomorrow. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, next, um, any comments from the public on agenda items? No, not. Next, uh, we'd like to welcome Justin Alphon to make a presentation to the board about full plates, full potential. Good evening, uh, my name is Justin Alphon. Thank you for the opportunity to come and speak uh, to the Cape Elizabeth School Board. I wanna thank Heather in particular. She's had a great conversation with the other co-founder of Full Plates for Potential, John Woods, who's a Cape Elizabeth resident. And I think you all probably have seen many of his kids come through Cape. Um, I'm gonna pass out something doing something that usually doesn't work because you'll all be looking at this, but we do need to take a look at this. So I'll pass this out and while I'm passing it out, um, I'll tell you a little bit about Full Plates. I only have two of the hierarchy things, so maybe you can just share those. But um, essentially, um, Full Plates, Full Potential is a statewide nonprofit, and we work across the state to end childhood hunger, looking at how we maximize the underutilized USDA programs, so breakfast, lunch, after school, and summertime feedings. So all we're looking at across the state is to work with school districts and nonprofits that want to make food access a priority and normalize it just like you do toilet paper and textbooks. So it's a pretty simple concept, yet it's usually more complicated than that when we're trying to make sure that every child in a school or a nonprofit gets fed. So we do this by partnering with schools uh, like yours or any across the state or nonprofits that um, have eligibility rates that are, whether it's 5% like yours is or 90% like some districts. And we say to the school district, um, first, do you want, is this, is this something that you want to work on? Great, check the box. Do you want to make food access a priority? Great, check the box. And then how do we look at some of your programs that you are delivering, like breakfast, like lunch, like after school, and like summer, and how do we utilize that program more effectively? What do I mean by that? So, for example, breakfast in the classroom. So, uh, breakfast in the classroom is a best practice. There's lots of school districts across the state that still use breakfast in the cafeteria. So, I'm not sure, sure exactly what you guys do in all of your three schools, but ultimately, what we want to do is we want to look at best practices, not only here in Maine, but best practices around the country, and one of those best practices is breakfast in the classroom. When you put breakfast in the classroom, all of a sudden you take away all of the challenges that families and children face when they try to get to school on time, buses don't get there on time, um, you make a decision on whether you go out to the playground versus going to the cafeteria, you can remove all of that by just putting breakfast in the classroom or a cart outside of the classroom to make breakfast more accessible. Um, what we um, are doing, I think, very well is trying to create lots of carrots for schools to think about these programs differently. So just because moving breakfast in the classroom sounds easy, it costs. It costs money, you know, it costs money for startup like to move food from your cafeteria to your classroom. So we'll, if you all, Cape Elizabeth or any school says, what well, we wanna do this, but it's gonna cost money to buy a cart, maybe coolers, maybe POS um, you know, um, uh, systems. We then pay for those one-time costs to try to make systematic changes for your school district. And so uh, that is what we do a lot for breakfast and for after school, for summertime, and also uh, for um, other USDA programs. So looking at your chart, um, we did, I just did a quick study. I could have picked um, any month, but I just picked April of 2018. 
And you can see there, um, actually, I think I might have passed out too many. There's plenty over here. So um, you can see that um, Cape Elizabeth has a very, very low um, uh, eligibility rate of free and reduced, but still there are 95 children every day that come to three of your schools that um, are looking and needing um, free or reduced meals. And you can look at your high school um, with your 31 students, your middle school of 32, and your elementary of 32. See um, how many are eligible for free in those schools, how many are eligible for reduced, and then the participation rates for lunch, breakfast, uh, of those schools. Again, just in April, I just took one, I could have picked any month. Um, and you can see that, you know, uh, not surprisingly, um, and this typically happens in any school district, once you get higher up, in high school especially, children, actually young adults, you know, aren't gonna opt in to um, free and reduced meals, but um, you're at 48% in your high school is actually a pretty impressive number for lunch, 26 uh, for breakfast in your high school. That last column is, a, is one that uh, a lot of people um, often pay attention to is the, the dollars that, you are, that are available for Cape Elizabeth or any school that are not being utilized because those children aren't participating. So again, if you look at the high school stat, um, $1,871 in the month of April was not used because those children, uh, those students in high school did not take advantage of the free lunch and free breakfast. So, where do, where do you go from here? How would I suggest um, continuing this conversation? I would say um, a couple things. One, um, if you truly want to make food access a priority, which I, it sounds like you do, um, there are grant programs for us to look at um, if you think that that would be helpful, again, for breakfast and lunch and summer and after school. There's also ways to work uh, around technical assistance with your food director as far as maybe it's not necessarily the uh, method of getting this food to the children, but maybe it's, you know, I looked at your uh, menu uh, for September and October, it looks delicious. But there are some school districts that are getting huge participation rates because they're actually testing those menus with children before, excuse me, testing those um, actual individual um, kind of lunch or breakfast with the children before they ever put them on the menu, similar to a restaurant. You, would, you, you never would put something on your menu unless you've tried it repeatedly, and so you could look at things and techniques like that. So there's all kinds of different ideas um, and best practices that we would love to bring to the district. Again, we think of ourselves as an ally. We, we know that every school is doing uh, the best they can, especially food directors, which seem to bear the brunt of um, every sort of um, uh, criticism, the food's not good enough, the food, you know, the, we don't like eating at 10.30, we, you know, the periods are too short, you could go on and on and on, but um, we like to work, uh, the, the food directors are our allies, the food directors are the folks that are on the front lines that are really making it possible for these students to eat every day, um, which is exciting, necessary, and needed because um, no matter how you cut it, when a child's hungry, they're not gonna reach their full potential they're gonna have more trips to the nurse, they're gonna have more disciplinary problems, their attendance is gonna be down. And academically, it's been proven that you know, when you miss breakfast or lunch or meals repeatedly, uh, the, the uh, amount of challenges that that child faces is immense. And so we can prevent it. We're ag state, we've got plenty of food, uh, we got plenty of uh, community members that are very, very interested in supporting this and Full Plate's full potential is here to be a partner happy to answer any questions. Yes. First, thank you so much yeah. for coming here tonight. Yes, um, one question I have is for the schools who are currently participating in Full Plates, um, is the food director limited more so or the same by what can be served um, you know, by the USDA? Or so uh, the USDA, uh, as well as the state of Maine, has rules and regulations for nutritional content and the components of every meal. And so uh, there are some schools that seem to be um, 
better at complying, not so much complying, but being more flexible and more creative with the meals that they serve and others. And I think, again, um, those districts are really doing a great job engaging those students. Those students have usually clubs, and those clubs are getting very, very involved, getting their hands um, dirty in the sense of, you know, uh, figuring out what is going, what are, what are, what are their peers going to eat, and testing it, and trials, and making sure that before something gets on the menu, it truly is something that people want. Um, so, and there's districts out there. I mean, I would uh, say that a district that comes to mind is the Wyndham District. I mean, if you go to, if you go on their website, they have a huge piece just all on food, and, and 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 they celebrate food, and they talk about what's coming up, and they really talk about this. They have a whole month where they introduce a new food every single day of the month. I mean, this is just uh, it's just a culture that. Um, I didn't know it existed until we started seeing it, and it really seems to be um, engaging their parents and, uh, and students. So it sounds like the, um, the program is not limited further. Like I, I would hate for the, you know, the enforcement to be tighter on what can and can't be served if we were to go down this route. It sounds like that's not the Oh, case. no, so no, yeah, I mean, ultimately what we're trying to do is open up more off-ramps for schools. I mean, we're not trying to close or make more restrictions. I mean, one of our, our biggest partner is the main Department of Education. Every, you know, they're around the table with us making all the fun decisions on how we um, think about creating more food access, how we remove barriers, I mean, they, I mean, they love the fact that we're getting more grants out to schools to make these changes to breakfast and to after school. I mean, Super Snacks or CACFP, which is a child and adult care food program. This is just an amazing program uh, that they and, and Full Plates and many other partners are talking about all the time because very few school districts are using it. So any of your clubs, any of your sports teams, if they're around after school, which many of them are, you can all of a sudden feed these children uh, super snacks, um, and these are just uh, these are programs that we're trying to open up for schools. Uh, quite opposite of trying to make it more restrictive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's hot in here. Sorry. John. So, yeah. so if you go down this road and you sort of really adopt these best practices and sort of really address the problem, what, what kind of rates are do you think do you see that are attainable? Because I'm I'm very interested in in in. I look at this, I see non-participation rates that concern me because I know how it does affect them. So what, what, what kind of rates are attainable? Well, I mean, I uh, believe, and I think many of my colleagues and the partners around Full Place will potentially believe that we can end child hunger in Maine. And I think we do that by school district by school district. And when you have um, 95 eligible children, um, I believe you could be the first town in the state of Maine to completely remove hunger that every single one of these children is eating every single day. And you can put a flag and put it up very high to say in Cape Elizabeth, we don't have a child who comes to school um, that is hungry because we make sure and we go above and beyond to make sure that every one of these children feels that food is normalized, that there's no stigma attached, and that we're creating great, great food programs for them every single day of the year. And I think we can do that in every district, whether that's here in Cape Elizabeth or up in the Allagash. Um, it's just, again, the commitment by decision makers like yourself, commitment by um, the community at large. I mean, the biggest problem, I think, around childhood hunger in the state of Maine is most people don't know it exists in their town or don't know it exists at the level so, of it is in the town. Yeah, so I, I just looked at the numbers. It's, a, it's just under 6%, yep. um, which is, uh, that's a big number when you think about, you know, when you think about what it's actually talking to in terms of hunger. So I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the issue. I'm really interested in, in looking at how to eliminate it. And I, I'm very much interested in what you talked about, the best practices like breakfast in the classroom, because I think we found that when we put things as a priority, you kind of have to pair that priority with commitment, right. um, well, like we did with professional development. So doing something that uh, pairs a priority with a, with a commitment, um, something like breakfast in the classroom makes a lot of sense if you're really looking to move the needle. So appreciate yes. that. Yeah. I just have a question about, um, you mentioned just now the stigma piece of it. Um, you know, the, the idea of breakfast in the classroom seems very, I, I know there's lots of nuts and bolts to it, but that seems more manageable, manageable to me. Um, but 
John Wood was explaining when he was talking to me about this the first time about you know kids who have to go to the lunchroom to get their breakfast or people who have to go to their classroom and they're walking in and there's a girl they like who's near them and so they choose the classroom because they don't want somebody to know that they're going and being identified as somebody getting the, the free breakfast through this. So do you have um, methods and uh, plans and how do you uh, handle stigma since you brought it up a few moments yeah, ago? Sure. Well, you guys, culture. yeah. So you, you are you already are doing some incredible things. So your lunchtime online application is terrific. I mean, so the idea that you can actually apply online without having to actually bring in a form into school uh, or sending the form home with students with a pile of stacks of forms the first week of class. I mean, that is that's brilliant. I mean, that in itself, if that gets submitted, no one sees it. There's no form for anyone to kind of miss. Uh, misplaced or to be embarrassed to give. So that in itself is wonderful and that's where we want more school districts to go. I mean again, the more if if a hundred if if we could make every school district a place where everyone's eating the same meal. So I don't know what happens in elementary and middle and Kate and high school here in Cape, but if everyone ate your meals every single day that was made from your uh, food director and from the wonderful staff that works with your food director, that would change the stigma. I mean, if everyone, if no one brought in a brown paper bag and everyone ate the meal every single day and everyone celebrated all the wonderful nutrients and great menu planning and everything like that, then you'd have no stigma because we'd all be eating the same meal together every single day because of its high quality, its nutritional standards, the outcomes that we all want. So that that is a perfect scenario. That, that removes stigma, and that's what you see in some school districts that have very, very high uh, eligibility rates where they move to community eligibility provision, CEP, and every child eats free breakfast and free lunch every single day. And they're eating together, and, and there's very few children that are bringing in their own uh, bag lunches. Um, so that, that to it, that's like the perfect scenario. And then I think you have to find what works for your district. I mean, the thing about Maine is there's, it's a big state. It's, there's no cookie cutter answer for every single community. But um, ultimately, what you really want to do and, and continue to try to do is make sure that food is accessible. There's few, there's few barriers uh, at, at, at any step of the way and to ensure that every child, especially a child who is free or reduced, feels that access to food as normalized as possible. I mean, you just don't want to make, you just don't want to make it where they're struggling or having to make the choice. Do I go out to recess or do I go have breakfast? Do I, you know, go hang out in homeroom or go have breakfast? I mean, those are, those are tough choices for children. And, you know, ultimately, you know, Justin wants to be just like every other child, and they want to just be like, you know, you. we all want to be together. So every time you're making, a, you're having to force a child or a family to make a decision that outs them, that's a difficult choice, no matter what age, no matter what district, no matter what state you're in. Yeah. Just yeah. ask you, um, I know you mentioned this, but let's say we're, we're very interested and we want to take the next step. What is the next step? Um, so uh, contacting uh, myself, um, at Justin, uh, Jay Alfond at fullplates.org. Uh, okay. um, and then ultimately um, us coming up with a plan uh, with you, your superintendent, your food director, and everyone around the table saying, okay, how do we tackle these 95 children in the most accessible, inclusive way possible and can we go further because ultimately I suspect just like any district um, there's more than 95 children that actually qualify for free and reduced but that's ultimately you've hit that limit because that's who, all the families that want to out themselves there's probably more and so how do we also think about those those children and those families that are also struggling that aren't filling out the online application or bringing in the paper application and that's just, I mean, a commitment by you all, a commitment by the food director, a commitment by the community saying we're going to eliminate hunger in Cape. And, you know, and there's strategies, um, and the, those, 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 those details will be fleshed out in subsequent meetings, hopefully. Right. It sounds like a potential committee to, have, to start the discussions and then bring things forward to the board as things progress. 
Yeah. No, it's good that you asked one of my questions already. So, um, how are you doing? I know it's hot there. Yeah, it's hot, hot. It's there. not our fault, it's Maine's fault. I can't <laughs> predict the weather. The heat is on, and, yeah. and yet it's. Anyhow, um, so you talked about uh, food quite a bit, and you haven't mentioned it yet, and I'm sure you're thinking about it, and it comes part with education. There's a lot of waste of food as well by kids. Uh, they grab stuff, they don't eat it, they throw it. So that's, education will take care of that. And some schools like in Portland area, as you know, there's a lot of great Muslim population there. And they don't serve halal food in cafeterias. So therefore, all those students are counted, meals are made for them, but they're not gonna eat and touch that meat. So I was wondering if you give it consideration to things like that. I love the idea of the uh, hallway uh, corridor for food. Eating in the classroom, I don't know about that, but that can be discussed. Um, but having snacks available at all time for the kids, I mean, we all do this in our house. I, if there is an apple in the counter, the kids will not grab it. Not grab it. But if you cut it and slice it and put it nicely in the plate, they'll eat it right away. They will not stop it. So having that kind of healthy food available in hallways or certain areas of the school, especially for kids who go into sports or coming out of sports in those places. And so I just wanted to give some thoughts, and particularly about food waste. I would like to know how you are addressing that. So uh, great question, and uh, by um, all accounts, if you listen to the students, you know they don't eat any of the food, and they all they dump it off. But that's not the truth. Is that you guys do? People, I mean, the, the food directors are doing an incredible job working with the rules and regulations. But let's go back to again the breakfast in the classroom concept, or the cart outside of the uh, classroom. You grab your food, it has all the free components that you need for breakfast, you bring it in. And then in almost uh, all classrooms across the state of Maine, if you don't eat something in that you know, back lunch or one of the components, then there's a sharing table. And that sharing table's in that room. And then if a child is hungry during the day or wants to take something home, that just goes home with them. So nothing truly gets dumped. Nothing gets truly get wasted, hopefully. In the best case scenario, I'm not saying there's no waste, yeah. but I'm saying in the best case scenario, best practices, that in a corner after breakfast, you know, you, you just put you put what you don't eat, obviously non-perishable, I mean, milks and this and that, they have to, you know, you know hopefully get drank, uh, drunk and boom, they're done. But, so that's one piece. As far as um, um, the a second question about um, diverse communities like Lewiston, like Portland, some others. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a really um, important piece for us to bring up that to make sure that we're creating um, culturally in, uh, rich foods for all cultures, not just you know, uh, for uh, Mainers that are native Mainers. And I think it's a really, really important piece. I don't think schools are necessarily doing a great job with it, even Portland, but I know that Jane McLucas is working her tail off with her food uh, staff to figure out how they incorporate more culturally um, diverse foods so that um, uh, everyone can enjoy them and there's, and there's opportunities for every child um, across uh, the, the city of Portland or city of Lewiston or you know, communities such as that. Um, and then I, I think, I guess I would end by saying that, you know, bringing up Wyndham again. You know, this food director doesn't put something on her menu for the calendar until she's experimented with a, a, a broad group of students. So they, and, and, they, and they're willing to tell her no, like this is not gonna fly, like we're not gonna eat, you know, butterfly carrots or whatever it might be. I mean, so like just, I, I don't know what it might be, I'm just using that as a bad example, but they, they, so, and just like, I mean, students are your ultimate customers. They're, your, they're going to tell you yes or no. And it's just like going out to a restaurant. I mean, there's certain things that sell and certain things that don't sell. The things that don't sell, you know, they're not on the menu uh, much longer. And I would say the same thing uh, that with great um, school districts that have committed food programs is that they're not putting anything on their menu that they don't feel like they can, that the students are gonna eat. And then you also have um, a group of students that are out there psyched that they helped build the, the calendar. 
Then they're talking to their peers saying, this was my, you know, this was my influence. I got, you know, tacos on here, or I got this on there. And so now you're creating momentum before, you know, that calendar even comes out. And I think, you know, the more skin in the game that we all have, whether it's community members, students, parents, those without parents, the better. I mean, that's, that's what we want. You want a committed community, and I think that's, again, what I think we all strive for, to normalize food, to make it super accessible, to make it super nutritious, to make it delicious. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's what we're, the ultimate goal. I mean, if it all gets dumped, then that's, uh, that's a, I mean, we can feel good about ourselves that we're creating access, but you gotta actually get the food <laughs> you know, into uh, the, the, the children and to the students. I, I love the idea. I, I think I am sad to see how many students that we have um, suffering with hunger every day. Um, so you've mentioned grants um, and things of that ilk. Um, what might be a financial commitment on our end? Or, um... So uh, generally, um, full plates, full potential doesn't pay for staff and doesn't pay for food because if the if a community isn't committed to those two pieces. A cart isn't going to help you feed more children. But what we um, like to do is say, okay, if we can, through a, a lot of hard work, decide to move, again, I'm going to use the breakfast example, you know, breakfast out of your cafeteria and say in your elementary school into the classroom, you might say, well, that sounds like a great idea, but how are we actually going to move the food from the cafeteria to all the different uh, classrooms in the elementary school? And we'll say, well, you know, other school districts have, you know, bought this cart, and this cart's $1,200. And we would say, okay, if you guys are committed, and you get the superintendent and your food director, and you guys all sign off on it, or at least the chair does, um, then we would say, okay, um, you know, we might buy the cart for you entirely, because it's a one-time expense that can create systematic change at the elementary school. There might be a small match, depending on kind of um, what you guys all think would be helpful. So for, again, going back to the awareness, all of a sudden, say if we funded it for $1,000, we're like, you guys have to raise $200. And all of a sudden, we use our crowdfunding platform to try to raise the $200. And you guys are sending out emails and Facebooks and Instagram and all these things saying, you know, we, we have this opportunity to, to systematically change our elementary school by moving breakfast from in the cafeteria to the classroom. We need to raise $200. A, I, I suspect you'd probably raise the $200. Second, you'd be creating awareness of all of the children in elementary school. Third, you'd be having a great community conversation about, okay, can we actually end hunger in Cape Elizabeth? Why, you know, why are we just talking about elementary schools? What about the middle school? What about the high school? And so that's what you, I mean, and, and, that, and, it's, and it's, pro it's proven to work. Again, the public awareness is so big because everyone wants to think, no, there, there can't be 100 kids in Cape Elizabeth. You know, there's probably one or two or three. I mean, no, it's, it's 100 kids. And I suspect, again, I mean, 95, I suspect there's actually more just because, you know, there is the stigma of a family that doesn't want, you know, other people in town to know that they uh, need help. I mean, Mainers are really proud. We're really independent. And we uh, want to, um, you know, kind of keep that, you know, behind closed doors. But ultimately, um, we give grants from fifty dollars to sixty-five hundred dollars, depending on uh, the circumstances. Um, and can that one-time investment feed more kids? And if it can, then we're we're gonna we're gonna roll up our sleeves with you all and, and get to work. So thank you. Yes, sir. Um, I really, I'd like to thank Justin for coming to speak to us tonight about this and thank you both for bringing this conversation up. Interestingly, this conversation, uh, a version of it happened in policy committee a couple of weeks ago, um, separate and we not having anything to do with full plates, full potential, but um, brought up by our food services director, our high school nurse, and our high school principal, really just talking about the nutrition program at the high school and the, the partic participation rate. And um, so I think that it's, it's kismet to have this conversation. And um, I, I caution that we don't make a decision in isolation because there, there are other voices that need to weigh in. And um, I will share that the, the biggest issue that um, the high school folks weighed in on, if I'm correct, was really around stigma. Um, and so, because the regulations that that the um, 
I believe it's the federal government, am I correct, put on what students must take, it really singles them out from other students. And so either they're not participating because they don't, it's stigma. They'll either take it and throw it away or not take it because they don't, it really singles them out. So it's, it's gonna be a, you know, it's a, it's a tricky conversation because I don't know that it's as simple as a cart or moving breakfast. I mean, it could be different at the different schools, but I think stigma plays a huge role in Cape Elizabeth in particular. And, and I would agree, no doubt, it, as you get older, um, it gets trickier and trickier. Um, if you're a freshman, you're already going through plenty of things in your life, and then all of a sudden you've got to go uh, into the cafeteria and grab those you know, three or four components. And while you feel like every eye in that cafeteria room is looking at you saying, you're, you're, you know, you're the child that needs, or you're the student, you're the freshman that needs help, right? And your parents aren't you know, doing as well as mine, or dot, 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 dot. So, um, and it's, it, it, it is not as easy as getting a cart, and I, and I applaud you for saying that and recognizing that. And um, it does take a big time commitment. It's, one of the things we're looking at, especially in the high schools, is, I mean, cafeterias and, um, often are pretty um, medicalized. And they're not very exciting to go into, right? I mean, it's not, it's in, in the sense that it's just like this box and everyone's sitting, you know, on a, you know, something that we all remember possibly sitting at. Um, and, you know, how do we think about just small designs in actual cafeterias to make them more appealing to eat for everyone, including uh, children? Uh, and students who are free and reduced. But it's, it's a, by all means, this is not as simple um, as you go up the food chain to, as, the, as, as students get older. High school is very, very difficult. And is it, am I correct in my understanding that full plate, full potential is here to help us with this whole process, not just buy us a cart, but brainstorm with us? and work with us to come up with plans. Like you have experience behind you, you have successes behind you, you have tools behind you that there's support um, in your wisdom and knowledge and experience in, if we go forward. <coughs> Am I correct in You should that? be working for us, Heather, yes. All of those <laughs> things are true. Um, and yes. I did not mean to, I did yeah, not yeah, at all yeah. mean to diminish. Yeah. That wasn't yeah. my point yeah. at all. Just that I'm hoping that we can make this decision. We've, we've, we've got, there are other ideas as well around working with stigma to get all the voices together. Right. Because this is exciting. Right. And I do and, think yeah. um, we, we, I have expressed um, the, the connection through to have with Peter Esposito and was assured that, I mean, I know John speaks with them regularly and I'm sure you do as well. So I think there's that collaboration that's already happening and in the works as well. Sure. Yeah, and, and again, you know, if you have everyone around the table and you don't try to rush something, typically you can get to good policy and good results. Um, and I uh, applaud you all for already having and starting the conversation. We're here to help if, if we can provide examples of other school districts, if we can provide um, you know, more resources to any other nonprofits or the main department of education. Those are the things that we do all the time. And you're right, sometimes it's grants and sometimes it's just the technical expertise. And sometimes it's just, you know, in some districts they haven't seen, you know, uh, support and cheerleaders and people just kind of saying, we're, we're behind you. And that is something that is just um, really, really important for their food program and their school district. So we provide it in all kinds of ways. Um, we are here to help. We are not here to kind of say, you're, you're doing a poor job and you need, I mean, that, and I, I know you didn't say that, I'm not suggesting you did. But, but I just, I, I think it's just important that we realize that we don't walk in your shoes, we don't walk in the food director's shoes, we don't walk in the superintendent's shoes, but, we, but we're seeing a lot of shoes now. We're seeing a lot of districts now, and we're having a lot of successes by our, with other school districts saying, we want to do this and, you know, and how do we do it too. Thank you so much, Justin. Um, I think the timing's perfect. Thank Appreciate you so it. much. Thank you. Okay. All right, next we have administrative reports beginning with principals. Why don't we start with the high school this time and work down? <laughs>
So I think I think we're all focusing on sort of new programs, those sorts of things, in our respective schools. So um, I want to focus on a couple things. Um, they aren't necessarily new, but they're sort of significant expansions of existing programs. And the the one that I think the school board has heard about in the past is um, the participation rate in PAS this year has has more than doubled. Um, I think it's almost tripled, actually. Um, so I think we're at about 16 students. We started out with about 20, and there were a couple of students who came back, and one of those has gone back. <laughs> so sort of a little bit of going back and forth in terms of what... Um, how much time they want to spend in another school versus staying in Cape Elizabeth High School. But in any event, it's a, it's a big, significant number compared to what we historically have had. So I think it's a great opportunity that kids are beginning to recognize and take advantage of. Um, Nate Carpenter and I this afternoon were actually talking about um, programs that are not at paths um, that would be of high interest to some of our students and whether there's a way that we can get some of our students to access those even at another school. Um, so that's something we're gonna be looking into this year. Um, so that's PATHS. Um, we'll be inviting the, somebody from PATHS to come and talk to all of, all of our sophomores again, which I think is why there was such a significant increase in numbers. Um, so that'll be happening either later this month or early next month, but well in advance of student course selection for next year. Um, our freshman academy, um, we now have three freshman academies in the high school um, that serves somewhere between 30 and 40% of all of our incoming freshmen. Um, it's a, it's, it's, I would say it's been a runaway success. Um, and the original freshman academy was taught by a trio of Nate Carpenter, Tom Cohan and Ben Raymond, they continue to teach one of them. Um, and then Tom Cohan teaches another one uh, with another, with Sarah Becco, who's one of our PE teachers. And then there's another one that's taught by Danielle Grimes, who's a social worker, and Ben Raymond. Um, so they each serve slightly different clientele, um, but there's some great experiments and sort of gradually building capacity of staff to understand what that opportunity can look like. So excited about that. Um, I will say that since our freshman academy has gone into existence at the high school, one of the things that's amazing to me is how few ninth graders we have coming to the assistant principal's office in a, in a sort of responsive way because they've made some, some choices that um, cause them to have a conversation with Nate. So he's having lots of conversations with them, but it tends to be more in a proactive, positive way. Um, which is really great. Um, there was a summer program, and I don't want to talk in great detail about it, but if the board is interested at some point, um, I think it would be really potentially interesting to the board to hear about. Um, Joyce Nato, who is one of our social workers, received a grant from the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation to do some really interesting, to offer some very interesting cultural opportunities to kids whose world tends to be a little more Cape Elizabeth-centric. Um, so this group of it was in a very eclectic group of kids, and the group of kids went to a play up in Monmouth, they went to a Thai restaurant in Boston, the Boston Museum of Art, they went to an opera, um, and just a whole bunch of really cool experiences. Um, Courtney Farrell, who's one of our math teachers, sort of joined on with Joyce and was involved in, every, I think, every single one of the events. So it was a really eye-opening experience for an eclectic group of kids, and if the board has an interest at some point, I know Joyce would be happy to, happy to um, share that with you. And the other thing I will say is that this is a few weeks ago, uh, we had our student activities fair, and I am always amazed by what I learned about new clubs that I didn't even know we had that are now in existence. Um, one that caused me to have a conversation with Mr. St. Char pretty quickly because I didn't know anything about it, but he had extensive conversations with Jeff Thorak, our athletic director, was there was a table for a boxing club. Um, there is no actual sparring is what Mr. What Mr. St. Char sort of assured me of. They're going to be doing some training and that sort of stuff and hitting bags and that kind of thing. He was in the military, so he's had a lot of training with sort of self-defense issues and that sort of thing. Um, so there's a boxing club. There's a thriving board games club. Yes. Um, and 
so you get like 15 to 20 kids after school just playing a whole variety of board games. Um, and I have a feeling that's one that's going to actually um, grow even more because I think board games are a, um, an excitingly up and returning sort of uh, avenue of entertainment. Um, there may be a beekeeping club, depending on whether or not CIF uh, funds a grant that uh, uh, one of our stu students who I'm meeting with tomorrow to talk about it is, is working on. Um, there's a young activist club that is sort of becoming very active this year. And then there's a sewing club, which I think is small but growing with sewing. So there we go. And there were others as well. Those are the ones I just remembered really quickly. Uh, it's like, where did these things come from? But the amazing thing is teachers respond to the call from students about would you be willing to sort of be an advisor for this new venture? So it's, it's really cool and it's, it's neat to see the kids' energy and sort of student-directed um, activities that are being added to the high school all the time. It's exciting. What, what is the rule? What is the rule to be number of people that needs to organize a club? To so organize a club, there is no... take one person? There's, there's got to be at least one student, one student and okay. one advisor. Yeah. <laughs> and it's got to be open to everybody and advertised as being okay. available to everybody. Cool. So it's, it's a low bar in terms of getting things started. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Tucky, my laptop with me. Um, so at the middle school, there's a bunch of things going on, kind of all under really the, the overall idea of engagement. Um, so our idea was how do we have staff that we have? How do we put them in areas that they thrive in? Um, you know, it's not always about class size, it's about programs, and it's about the right programs. And what do we have for kids, and what support kids? So some things that we have going on is we um, have a year-long focus on personal health and wellness, supported by the Thompson family and CEF. Uh, that really the theme is you will be found at CEMS. C -E -M -S. Uh, that kicked off our school year with the assembly, um, followed by community circles for students, led by their teachers, uh, just to kind of debrief quickly and have some follow-up to, to the morning assembly. Um, the really cool part was that was all followed up by teachers getting professional development on um, how do you approach somebody if you're concerned about them and is it your place or not? Uh, because I think a lot of times we're intimidated or worried about talking about things we're not feeling like we're experts on, um, but really the idea was to just go ahead and do it and kind of get that empowering message for teachers. Uh, so that was kind of how we started our year. That kind of began the partnership with the Yellow Tulip um, initiative or project. Uh, and I'm trying, I think we're working on coining the phrase junior ambassadors for that. So that's where we're kind of headed. And tomorrow we will be planting 600 yellow tulips in front of the middle school. Uh, the impressive part to me about that is 600 is a lot. And I don't know how we're going to quite pull it off, but it's going to happen tomorrow. And <laughs> to think about it, we had a teacher there rototilling on Friday, the Friday of a three-day break. Um, to see them up there working on that when they could have been home was, was impressive. And then I get an email, another snap chat or whatever, I don't know, something I got from them saying, oh, it's all done. And, and two more people joined on Monday over break to come in and finish it so it'll be ready. So, so that feeling of, I think, unity is pretty powerful in itself. Um, the challenge to any year-long kind of project is how do you keep it going when there's not a big fancy shiny thing to do? Uh, so one of the ideas that we have, and I, and I think it's going to happen pretty soon, I'm really not much of a planner, I'm kind of a doer, so I'm getting held back a little bit because my nurse, Jill Young, also is a doer. Um, so we're kind of being reined in, but there's going to be a whole school reading, um, really focusing on perceptions versus reality and how it impacts kids at school and just in life in general. Uh, we're thinking that's going to be a whole school book read where it's going to actually be read to kids through guest readers in the morning, so everybody hears the same message. Uh, so that's kind of on the horizon and it's going to be coming up pretty soon. It's supposed to be not a lot of effort, but a lot of impact hopefully for kids. Uh, a couple other things that are pretty unique I think to us, our school counselors have really stepped up and kind of raised the bar a little bit. They, in the past, we had two school counselors. I've added the new social worker position um, to really meet the need of a lot of kids. And well, in the past, I think that students would get a eight to 10 guidance lessons throughout a year. And it was kind of hodgepodge in there whenever it seemed to fit. 
and now they're built into the schedule and kids will get 20, oh, at least 20 lessons this year through that process, every kid. And I'm happy to report that every kid has, at this point, already had one of those guidance lessons. So those three people have seen every kid in the school already. To me, that's just, that's amazing to have that happen. Um, and to have kids all of a sudden get to know you in the beginning of the year before they may need you <laughs> is, a, is a pretty strong thing. Uh, kind of a byproduct of that, really it was kind of also planned, but it's really working well. When that's happening, when kids are going to guidance, the teachers that they would normally have the one teacher, so it's taking, if I'm a teacher, the guidance, the kids will go to my door that day, hopefully I've told them the day before, but kids will go to the door and I'll say, oh, today's your guidance day, and each class goes there. Uh, that allows the teacher to not have to make sub plans, to not have a sub, we don't have to hire a sub, and teachers are now going to do peer visits during that time, and they're unrestricted. They can, I encouraging, I'm encouraging them to go off-site to somewhere that something awesome and cool is happening um, or something that intrigues them and see how someone else is doing it. We've had teachers go to the high school and see where do the kids go when I actually get rid of them in eighth grade? Like, where do they go? And so they've gone up and seen that. Like, what am I preparing them for in AP stats or whatever it is? So that's been pretty powerful. We've had people go visit Yarmouth. We've had a person in Wyndham today and they're coming back with energy and ideas and, and, and a kind of a fire that is interesting to see. So, so all of that's happening through the guidance and benefiting for kids. Um, middle School Academy is kind of, you know, really trying to follow along with Freshman Academy and we're getting to the point now where kids are starting to be referred to Middle School Academy and I'm excited to see how that program's gonna go, but it's really about executive functioning skills, emotional skill, social emotional skills, and academic skills. Uh, how are we gonna be able to help support kids with that before it becomes a larger issue for them? And what kind of strategies can we give them? Uh, and then lastly, the Beacon program is designed for some students that were really struggling to, so we, school was, may not have been working exactly the way we wanted it to for them. Um, and it's, it's been a great success for the students and staff. It's small, I think it has right now about nine students in it and growing, um, but the program has a strong social emotional component, teamwork built in, um, and it's designed to be fluid. It's not a place where somebody just goes to stay. Uh, they go there when they need it, and then they're out in the mainstream classrooms um, also working as well. So, so that program has been a huge success, and, and the immediate successes can be seen in that from their attendance rates, their engagement in, in class, um, and just some of their, their overall engagement in school. You know, smiles, as opposed to, you know, not sure where I fit. Um, so that program has been a huge success, and I think it's gonna continue to grow. So without boring you anymore, and kind of why I've been holding off on sharing this is I really want these people to come and share it, um, share the work they've done. But that's kind of a highlight as to what you guys can look forward to. Tiny question. The middle school, so the freshman academy is clearly in for freshmen. Um, middle school academy for fifth graders, or it's all? all yeah, five school. through eight. And it really kind of came as if, if we're sending that much need to the high school, then we should be addressing that somehow. Um, and, if, and if we can help someone in fifth grade, maybe there's not the need in seventh, eighth, and ninth that that this currently is. So that's really kind of the goal. Thank you, it sounds like so much exciting stuff. And There's a lot happening. Cool. Yeah, it's happen. fun. Yeah. Anything you. else? I have one more question. I'm delighted to hear sort of the impact on attendance rates. I know um, attendance rates for a variety of different reasons were somewhat of a challenge. Are you seeing big moves on that? Is that um, for the Beacon program, yes, for that group of kids. That and for the whole school, I've started sending out letters, attendance letters, early. They're already going out. Um, so I think that's gonna have a difference. Our attendance rate was right around 94, 95%. And if we fall below 94.5, then we're a failing school, no matter how we perform on a test. So, so it's really about getting that word out there and, and trying to you know, push that a little bit. I think it's a district goal that we're working on and um, those letters are, they cause some uncomfortable conversations, you know, because it's, it seems kind of attacking, but it's really just for truancy, you can be excused, it doesn't, it may not impact you for truancy, but if you miss a day, we're not reteaching a whole nother day. 
So that a day missed is truly a day missed. So how do we get there? So. Are you saying beacon or vegan? Beacon. <laughs> no, beacon. Yeah. Um, so it was really it was a catchy name that the group of teachers came up with um, to define it. Good. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. If anybody wants to plant tulips in the morning, we might be able to use some help. <laughs> Do I really have to follow that? <laughs> Anybody who can convince a middle school teacher to rototill on a Friday night must be pretty inspiring. Um, it was, I was actually leaving and I saw that and I was curious as to what was going on, but it sounds like a wonderful um, initiative and, and we plan to plant some tulips too, so we're excited about that. Uh, so I wanted to, so good evening, and I wanted to just uh, talk about three different areas tonight. Um, one, the first I've already mentioned, but I, I really wanted to start with our Peaceful Pond Cove initiative. Uh, at the last board meeting I talked about that, um, and what it, what it is is really, it's an opportunity for us to um, take a traditional paradigm on students and behavior and really just flip it upside down. And so rather than focusing on identifying um, inappropriate behaviors, um, we focus on teaching appropriate behaviors and acknowledging them and praising students and just flooding um, the school with positivity. And so that's really what it is and that's what we're doing. So just to kind of review what that is and, and just to kind of go back also to where it started, this is some of the most profound work that we have done um, in the past year and a half or so. And it all started with an email from me to staff saying, we have this cool idea, anybody want to help? So volunteers before school, after school, um, just turned into this, um, this movement with its own momentum. And so now it really helps us identify who we are. And so again, just to kind of go over some bullet points, it's, um, you know, it's a research-based approach to behavior um, for all students throughout the school where um, common expectations are identified and directly taught to students and retaught if needed uh, in all the common areas of the school, including the school bus. And students are rewarded um, with lots of positivity for, for achieving those expectations. And so we believe that just like academics, we need to teach these, these skills. And so um, a, a fun way that we're acknowledging them is, um, you know, I have mentioned this, but when uh, staff members see students being safe, respectful, responsible, they get a chain link, it's a paper, chain link that we can make into chains and on it um, staff members write what the student was doing and how it was safe, respectful, responsible. And we're making a chain and going all throughout the building with it. And so we have, so far if you come and visit you'll see it right now travels from the office all the way around the lobby and we've made it up the stairs and headed down the third grade wing. So we just set little goals and when we reach a certain points I put I put little signs up, like we did it, and here's our next goal. And it just, it's, um, the chain links are tangible, but the power is in the conversation that the staff member has with the child, that positive <coughs> praise and defining what the child did. So uh, we're um, having an upcoming family night where we're inviting parents in to go over this with them and answer any questions they have. And we have our first Peaceful Pond Cove student assembly this Friday. Uh, so we're excited about that. Just to move on to um, something else that we have been making some significant shifts in is SST, our student support team. And um, you may remember that at an earlier board meeting I requested to um, designate a student support team leader for a minor increase in a stipend, take a member position and make it into a leader position. And that has uh, proven to be um, a really good move for us. We have someone now 
really organizing the system, the logistics of it, so that we're prepared when we have our SST meetings every Friday morning at 745 to really talk about students, student work, and help teachers develop plans um, for student success in the classroom. So we're becoming much more efficient and effective this year in SST, and I think people are feeling really good about that, and we're seeing quick results, quick, um, we're able to act quickly and put put uh, interventions in place for students. And uh, I just want to touch on again, just to give you an update on RTI and, um, I mean, there, there are many layers of RTI, but I particularly wanted to talk about our um, RTI educational technician, since that's still a relatively new um, position. Last year was our first full year, this year's our second. And so we learned a lot last year. We um, are developing more efficient ways to assess and more efficient ways to schedule and use our educational technicians. And this year we will start interventions uh, a full three weeks earlier than last year. So that, that's a lot, that, that's a lot more time for students to get what they need when they need it. And we're excited about that too. So that's all I have for tonight. Any questions about any of that? Yes. This is more, more of a comment actually and, and, and this is sort of broadly directed. I'm really impressed with what you're doing with Peaceful Pond Cove. I think that's something that is, um, is really helpful and what I would encourage is, I mean, I think we're seeing some of, I would encourage that there's visibility on what you're doing with behavior expectations all the way through to the middle school and high school because it starts at Pond Cove. And I, I think in the past there has been uh, very much sort of different sets of rules and expected behaviors in each building and really understanding throughout the entire school system where it starts and the, the because the students reinforce each other's behavior, and when you st and, and sort of you've seen it sort of happening with what's happening in freshman academy down to middle school academy, and you, I would hope that you would also be aware of some of what that is helped yes. addressing, and that there's sort of more school-wide approach to these are the expected behaviors, and they don't change when you change building. These are your expected behaviors in Pond Cove and through to adulthood, <laughs> and so, which goes through the middle school and high school. So I'm just encouraging more sort of visibility and observation and conversation with other administrators about setting those behavior expectations because they become very powerful because when these kids who are in Pond Cove now are in middle school and high school and they see younger kids not doing what they're supposed to, they know how to react. And they do, and they will. But if we don't set those expectations, they won't. Right. Thank you. Yes, Elizabeth. I want to thank all the principals for the email communications that um, you've been making available to parents and also have been sharing with the board whether we have students in that school or not. Um, but I wanted to particularly acknowledge that um, your newsletter for Pong Cove has kind of a new section that has all sorts of just information. And they're questions that I think board members get asked all the time. Like, how do we sign up for the free and reduced lunch program? It's on there, there's a link. How many snow days have we had? You already have a tracker. Like, all these things are already at the bottom of that newsletter. And I just want to give you a little shout out that I think Thank it's you. a really useful, helpful, all that. And I, I know I'm missing all sorts of stuff that you have there, but thank you for doing that. Thank you so much. I just want to thank all three of you. I, I think it's it's exciting to hear about what's happening, um, you know, from from this perspective in the schools, and uh, yeah, it's energizing. So thank you. Well, thank you all for your support too. Thanks. Thank you. Director of Special Services, Dell, would you like to go next? Hello, um, I just wanted to share that the school year in special ed has started off at a fast pace. Uh, we had quite a few students that were put into referral in the spring and have come due for their IEP meetings in the fall. Um, I wanted to speak to um, special ed positions. We are currently all filled with the exception of one full-time psychologist. We are continuing to contract with Dr. Beverly Strock on a contracted basis until we find a full-time position, person, excuse me. 
Uh, this past week, I attended a DOE mandated transition training for districts under review this year. Uh, one of our high school teachers attended as well. Uh, transitions is um, high school uh, students that are on IEP. When they get to the high school level, there's a transition plan that needs to be completed and filled out. And it is one of the markers that the state will be auditing us on. And uh, it's very specific. Uh, once we go to this training, then we'll be sending in uh, examples for them to score and send back to us. This, uh, I also attended a workshop at, by Drummond Woodson titled uh, AWOL, How Should Schools Respond to Students Who Don't Show Up? This focused on Maine's truancy laws, Maine's abuse and neglect laws, e ESSA's standards for chronic absenteeism, and federal and state special education laws. And a lot of the discussion was um, around those students that aren't showing up and that special ed, the special ed laws that are driving the need to, um, to seek out and find out what's going on with these students. But also the, um, and this, I mentioned this to Donna, is that uh, one of the pieces was the chronic absenteeism and uh, that uh, the ESA will be tracking that and that'll be uh, one of the uh, parts of the pieces that they'll be grading each district on. And it doesn't matter if they're excused or unexcused. That those, if it's above 10%, then you're considered chronic, uh, a chronic absentee. And I did want to just uh, update you on you know, the number of students we're servicing in special ed. It's 158 students. Pond Cove, we have 56. Uh, middle school, 51. High school, 51. We have 20 students currently in referral. Two students out of district. Any questions? Yes. The um, absentee um, number, the 10%, you have to fall under 10%. Is that only including special ed students, or is that all students? For all class? students. Oh, OK, good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Susan. Oh, sorry. Kathy. I'm sorry, what's that? I would encourage them to go home. Is that okay? Oh, sure, yeah. <laughs> so there is something else that's new at the middle school, and Troy said he'd be happy to have me talk about it tonight. <laughs> um, and that is how we're reporting student progress. Um, so what I'm handing out to you right now is um, a... There we go. Um, is what the parents will see um, when it's, these are, the, these are two actual pages from the parent portal with the, 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 the name blacked out. Um, but I thought we would go through this because um, then you will understand, I think, um, better what it is that we're actually doing at the middle school. So, um, so to begin with, um, you know, the, so schools exist so that students can learn, and um, students learn better um, when they understand exactly what it is they're supposed to be learning and where they stand in relation to those learning goals. So we start in this parent portal, and I guess I'll back up and say how you get to this page, and we are going to be sending out directions to parents, is when you're on the quick lookup screen, you click on the um, overall course grade for each course, and then this page comes up um, for each course. So you see um, at the top of the page, then you'll have the course grade, the final grade, um, and then there's a list of all of the learning targets for that course, and these are end of course learning targets. Um, and you, you can read along with me that below are the learning targets for this course. Learning target grades are averaged together to determine the overall course grade. And then there is a list of all of the learning targets. There's a shorthand version and then the longer learning target description. Again, this is what we want our students to know and be able to do in each course by the end of the school year. <coughs> then the next table um, shows how the student is doing in relation to those learning targets. 
Um, and so again, you can follow along. That learning target grades are determined by dividing the number of points earned by the number of points possible on all of the summative assessments aligned to the learning target. And learning target grades do not appear until at least one assessment aligned to that learning target has been entered. So in the case of, do you have uh, Mrs. Roberts on top? Is that the one you're looking at? Okay. So you can see that um, she has already assessed students on six of the learning targets. And we have um, the number of assessments aligned to each of those so far. The number of points possible, the number of points the students earned, and therefore the learning target grade. And so what we're hoping is that students, you know, in this case, this student would say, well, I'm doing really well at language conventions and at reading theme, and I need to do a little bit more work in terms of developing my writing so that they, um, they internalize, um, they're, they're aware of and they, they, they internalize um, their, their own sense of where they are and then they, and then they can take action to improve. Um, and then one thing that's, uh, well, any questions so far before I go to the next? Yeah, Heather. So uh, I, I think what you say sounds wonderful of, oh, well, I'm doing really well in this area, and this is the specific area of development of writing that needs help with. How is a student getting to that? Are teachers reviewing the, the, these um, learning targets and yes. where they are? Yeah, a lot of teachers have already, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. On a, on a regular basis so that, you know, somebody's sitting down with their child and saying, okay, so let's look at this together. You're doing really well here, and you're not... Because I could be wrong, but I thought that happened in advising a little bit, like go over the grades and see how you're doing last year, and there's no advising this year. So, and I hear that teachers are so stressed with time to get everything they're doing in. So that takes a little bit of individual one-on-one. -on -one. I'm just wondering how that's happening and when that's happening for the kids. Because I agree that the, the reflective piece of, of, of seeing this and understanding this is, is helpful, but right. I'm curious of how it actually make that happen. So, so a couple of things, and we are at the very beginning stages of this, but so teachers are in the process of posting the learning targets in the room, so that we're building awareness of what these learning targets are. I mean, students should know, be able to articulate what it is the, the goals, the learning goals in the particular class are. And then as far as their own progress goes, so you might have a test that's aligned to three different learning targets, and so the teacher is not going to give them an overall test grade. The teacher is going to report their progress on this section of the test, which is aligned to this learning target, you got this. And on this section of the test aligned to the listener, this learning target, you're going to get this. So it's not, um, so, and some teachers, um, and we'd like to have all teachers do this, but they're having the students actually track their progress um, to each learning target so that, that they know how they're doing and so a test might not come back as an 81 it correct might come back as an 81 a 75 and a 92. yeah if you look at right exactly so if you look at the um that's really different yeah so for example you might assign an essay in in ela right and so you give the student a score for theme and you give them a score for development um, so they're not getting an overall essay score the, the grades are organized by learning targets because that's then the student can say oh okay, I need to work on X, um, so. Okay, thank you. Sure, any other questions before I go on? I just. Yeah. So, first of all, yay, I'm happy to see learning targets um, uh, written out so in advance. I think that's really, really helpful. I think we're just starting to learn to use it. My question really is around, um, it would seem like getting used to, this is exactly what we want the students to all see and know up front. And then, well, this seems to be um, focused on this sort of, you want to meet these targets. Um, where in here also sort of, do, is there the uh, ability to sort of, what's the baseline, what's the progress? So if you have somebody who's actually already able to do these things, so how, uh, you, you want them not to just to be in class and it's so easy for them that they do them. So how does that sort of come into the mix? Well, so these, I mean, these are f fair, fairly broad as I, as I think that you can see if, if you, you, you read them through. Um, I mean, well, I, I, that's a great question and, and we do struggle with that, right? Um, but there are opportunities in each of these learning targets for students to go deep. And so, um, I think um, 
there are, there are situations in which a student may, at the beginning of the year, demonstrate that they are where the teacher would hope that they would be um, at the end of the year, and then it is up to that teacher to differentiate for that student. But, um, but the bar is set pretty high, and students are working toward that. I mean, we wouldn't, by and large, we don't expect students to, um, to you know, um, have met those end of course learning targets in September. I don't know if that answers exactly what you're asking. So, I guess what I'm saying, wondering is we have these targets, but yes. are we are we getting? Is it our intention, or are we now? Sorry, is it our? Do we now, or is it our intention to get baseline information around learning targets at the beginning of the year? Because it seems to me, what I remember, just back to my own experience. Um, in my English classes, I knew the five or six students who could write like crazy, mm -hmm. and they just pretty much coasted through most of the writing classes. And the amount of learning they were doing, I'm not sure it was necessarily based on the class. Some of it was, so it depends on how well they engaged. But my, my point is, 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 there's always a debate around education of whether you try, what standard are you trying to get to and what's progress. And so, and, and I think you have to engage in both. And I understand this is really is a standards based piece, mm -hmm. but I want to make sure that I, I, I'd like to understand where the progress element comes into it because I think that has a lot also to do with engagement and with individualizing the learning for the, for the learners. So these are all out there. If I were a student, I wanted want to know, get a, a, some assessment of either it's from last year or whatever it is. Where do I stand now? What do I, what, what do I need to work on? What really does normal normal progress, and where I need special uh, additional progress, and where I, I can go deep because I'm already. I want to know that about myself and right. set expectations appropriately. Right. And so within this, this is sort of designed specifically around. Um, achievement rather than progress, and I'm wondering where. Wait, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm following that. What do you so, mean? Design so, achievement, not uh, progress. Uh, proficiency basis. I'm proficient at this skill. Right. But it doesn't measure. Did you get any better at this skill, or were you that good when you started out the year? The, that's progress. Where did I start? Where did I get to? Okay, so if I, if I understand you correctly, so you're saying, so let's, um, if, if a, a teacher assigns an essay and they're focusing on development, then, um, and the student is, you know, depending on how the teacher grades, the student is gonna get, is, is maybe getting a four or they're getting a, a, a 99. And so you wanna make sure that that student is gonna continue to be challenged, that even though that, even though that is the grade that's being recorded, that they're still getting feedback from the student, from the teacher, so that they are able to get better, that they can continue to improve. So this seems like a system which is great that measures uh, proficiency attainment. Right. I'm wondering where there is a measure also of progress beyond just, because it doesn't sound like you're setting a baseline on what you're supposed to achieve from the beginning. So here's where I know I am on the map, and this is what I, where I need to get to. Yeah, okay, so there, d depending on the course and depending on the learning target, there, there are baseline expectations. So on a four point rubric, you would have, this is what it means to be a one, this is what it means to be a two, this is what it means to be a three, and this is what it means to be a four. And the student can self-assess and the teacher can assess. Um, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand, I, I understand that, but I guess what I'm saying is, do people find out where they are on these learning goals at the beginning, early on in the course? Yes. So they get, so. Well, this that, student knows and, right now. Okay, right, okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, this student knows right now where they so, are. Right. And, um. So I guess what I'm saying is, so for, on a number of them, they're at 100. Yes. Right. So how are the progress going to be measured for the rest of the year on those where they're at 100 this month? So they're, they're at a 100 on an assessment that is aligned to a learning target. Um, and there will be multiple assessments over the course of the year. And those assessments will, will um, it, it's not, this isn't one and done. 
So are these the targets for the year or are they the targets for the particular lesson? Well, we call them, we call them end of course learning targets, right? And, but every teacher has daily learning targets and then there are unit learning targets and these are all aligned to the end of course learning targets, which are fairly broad. Um, but um, so, so a student, a student might have a 100 on one assessment that's aligned to the learning target, but to really master that learning target, they're gonna to have to be assessed multiple times in multiple ways over the course of the year. There are, John, there are districts that have elected to have 700 learning targets, and that's what gets reported. And we're opting to have fewer, broader learning targets I'm very on board with the learning targets yeah. as you've defined them. And, and I think it's really helpful for a proficiency-based learning system uh, pro approach to it. This is what we're trying to get everyone to achieve. Great. I worry that you don't lose a measure of progress. What did I start out, where did I start out and what did, where did I get to in the process? So that's what I'm, that's what I, I feel like the structure you've put in place puts that way down in the middle of the deck and gets lost. So, well, so um, I, one thing, I, I think that's a good point. I think one thing I hope that this pushes actually is that knowing that, for example, because um, these are these are grades that students are going to be earning over the course of the year, so they don't have to worry about, I have to do really well in the first quarter because grades are going to start over in the second quarter and then those grades are going to be averaged together. Um, that this will, um, um, empower teachers to provide grades that really and truly reflect where the student is with the understanding is that the student is gonna get better over the course of the year. Uh, you know, speaking from experience, I used to, oh, go ahead, Donna. Um, in some courses, teachers are doing pre-assessments at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the unit, and so they would do a pre-assessment and a post-assessment, and that would give you the measure of growth. The pre-assessment won't necessarily be recorded in the grade book, but the teacher would, would be working with that. So, continue, sorry, I, no, I, I okay. didn't mean to hijack the conversation. No, that's all right, these I, are good questions and... and um, I, I must say, I do continue to worry about the students who get 100 on their learning targets early on, that whether or not they're actually having their progress measured and being engaged, because there's no place to measure that, that it, appears from this system. Duly noted, and, and it's a good point. Um, okay, the next table then is the habits, and that's on the back, is the habits of work grades because we wanna be really transparent with students and their parents about what is going into the grade that they earn. So um, if they're earning an 85, that should reflect the, what, they're, what they know um, and are able to do in terms of the academic learning targets. The habits of work that have often been assessed and um, mixed in with the uh, academic grade, and those would be things like turning work in on time, um, showing up to class on time with all of the materials, et cetera. Those are important, um, but, but it can be very confusing to students and parents when all of those grades are mixed together. So we're gonna have a separate table and at least once a month, teachers will be reporting student progress in the areas of respect, responsibility, and perseverance, which are the three habits of work that go, that, that uh, teachers will be reporting to beginning in kindergarten all the way up through 12th grade, respect, responsibility, and perseverance. And then the final table, excuse me, the final table is just a list of all of the assessments um, informing the grade and uh, shows which learning target they're aligned to and those are just in chronological order. Um, but if you wanted to see the exact assessments that it informed the grade on a learning target, you could, you could search the learning target to see.
And then, Kathy, on, just, I'm sorry, one oh, yeah, quick, no, go quick ahead. question. Just, great. So the, the flags, is that for like, per yep. assignment? Is yeah, let's actually, so if you turn to, um, so the second example that I have is from a math class, a seventh grade math class, that first was an eighth grade English class. Um, and the front of the page is the same, so now you know how to read that. But I did, because for whatever reason, when I printed, um, it, it didn't show the flags, and I wanted you to see um, what impact they can have. So, um, so on the back then of, uh, on the last page, um, you see again the habits of work grades table, and then you see the list of assessments, and then there you can see the actual um, use of the flag. So in this case, um, there were one, two, three, four, five practice um, assignments that were preparing the student to take um, the quiz that was aligned to the um, expressions and equations. Um, in a perfect world, um, rather than saying math HW practice, um, that would indicate the um, learning target that those homework practice assignments align to, and I'm assuming it's two expressions and equations, and that's something that you know, we'll be working on this year, but you can <laughs> see that none of those homeworks counted. Um, there's a little flag indicating excluded. So they are excluded from the final grade because that's just, that's the teacher giving the students opportunities to practice before they're actually assessed on the quiz that's aligned to that learning target. Before they take the quiz, I mean. Heather? I have a silly question, but this page looks very different from the other teacher's assessment page. Yes, and that and is I a. I have concerns about so many different systems and so many yeah. different ways. This is this. Parents and students. Uh, so, this is a screenshot. And I had to. If you were to go to this teacher and do a screenshot, it would You would look see, like this. it would look identical to the first page. Okay. The Great. only reason, for whatever reason, when I printed, the, the flags didn't show up. And okay. so okay. I just did a screenshot okay. and. I need yeah. that explanation. Okay. Thank yeah. you. I just yeah. think consistency with. Absolutely. This stuff is so confusing yeah. that when teachers do it differently or their own, it, it gets even more confusing. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Sure. Hope. Um, I just want to make a comments and general observation. I imagine that a tremendous amount of work went into implementing this, and I thank you for that, and I, I don't think that can be understated, how much work went into putting this in place and how much progress we've made from where we were, which was having very little to no information and information in a lot of different places. So um, I just wanted to acknowledge that. Thank you. And I think it gets us, it, it moves us forward um, in a positive way in aligning but from grade to grade so that we have the visibility of what's happening in each grade and also amongst teachers within each grade. So I think it's very important and I think I, there, there are kinks obviously. You're, yes. you're working with a lot of different people using the system and not everyone's doing exactly the same thing and I agree with John's point. You know, How do we know if the, if the children who are at 100 on day one are, but overall it's phenomenal and I really appreciate it. Thank you. I, I just like to add on my additional thanks and appreciation. I don't didn't mean that my, my commentary to try to understand what you've done to, didn't mean to discount. I, I'm really very pleased to see this level of throwing targets. I think you did a really nice and impressive job. Did that and everything that Hope was talking about. Thank I, you. I'm very encouraged. Good. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy. So we go from curriculum and student evaluations to finances. So um, the main thing I want to talk about tonight is this Fund 20 summary report. And as I was looking at it earlier and talked to a couple of administrators, I realized this is probably a little confusing. This is what we give to the auditor. Um, it should be in your packet, it looks like this. I know there's a lot of paper there, so. <laughs> Interfund, yeah, Interfund. Yep. Yep. yep, Interfund 20 summary, FY19. Yep. So this cover page shows, the very first column shows the revenue accounts. 
And the next column shows the expense department. As I said, this is the report we use for the auditor, so it may have a little too much information on it. And the descriptions that you see should equal exactly what you see on, uh, or very similar to what you see on the financial statements. Then column, then the column that title is titled July 1st, 2018, beginning balance. This is how much money we had in those funds as of the first of the year. And then the 1819 revenue column is how much we've received in funds since July 1st. The 1819 encumbered column is how much we have set aside in purchase orders. These are for items that we know we're going to purchase in the future, but we haven't purchased as yet. This is kind of set them set the sun money aside so that it will be there when we do need to make those expenditures. And then you have the 1819 expenditures column, and that is what we spent since July 1st. And then you have the balance year to date. It's the beginning balance plus revenue, less the encumbered and expenditures, and that's what you, um, that's what we have in those accounts at this point. You will notice that there are negative accounts. Um, the title counts and the local entitlement accounts are federal grants, and the way they work is that we have to spend the money first and then get reimbursed. So we spend it and then I invoice them to request the funds. But that's why I've added the additional revenue anticipated column, so you can see how much money that we've been allotted by those grants. Um, and that's, that's pertaining to the federal grants. Farther down, you'll see that CEF is a negative amount, and the amount we anticipate them from anticipate from them currently is uh, just enough to zero it out. That actually, we have a lot more grants going with CEF. It's just the way that the figures came out at this point. And that also goes, um, is the same for the flow through account. That's an account we use for trips and stuff when we know we'll be reimbursed from the schools so we can keep easier track of those separate monies. And so then the last column, it says balance as of June 30th, 2019. Well, no, those balances are gonna change as the year progresses. It's the um, year-end balance at this point in time, but we will be spending those funds and those balances will go down. So that was a bit of a misnomer. But the rest of the report is the description. You had asked for basically a description of what all the grants were. And so the rest of the report, pages two through four, lists all of the departments that are tied to those grants and the titles, but then it has a description of what every grant is, um, and then it does reiterate that June 30th, 2019 balance column. But you can read this on your own. I do tell you which ones are federal grants and which ones aren't. There is one out of all of these grants that we have, there is one that I can't find any information on. So if anybody knows anything about an easement fund balance or easement fund, please contact me. I have sent out emails and um, tried to find information, but no luck on that one. Everything else, it, I was doing a little um, treasure hunting the last couple of weeks trying to fi find out what the history behind some, behind some of these funds were. Do you, do you know how old it is? No, I don't even know that at this point. I haven't had a chance to go through to find out when the fund was first set up. But that is definitely a place to start. You, you might want to check around with the electrical work and upgrades that they did recently. That may have required some easement work. I'm not sure. It's older than that. It's before my time, and I've been here three years. So, so but I will look. I can go back to our accounting software and look to see when those funds were initially set up. It's just kind of hunt and peck kind of thing. So, um, so that's what I wanted. If you have any questions on it, let me know. If this is too confusing, please give me, I'm, I'm open. This is like the prototype, we can work from here, but at least it's starting to get the information out there. Um, and if there are any questions on that. Yeah, it's very clear, thank you. Very good. Thank oh, you good. so much. Thank, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. And just a quick one on the big financial statement. I just wanted to let you know that we are three quarters of the way through the year, not three quarters, oh my. We're one quarter of the way through the year. And so that'd be, so at that point we would have spent 25% of our funds. And if you notice that currently we're at 23.19 and um, Donna and I are meeting every month and going over through the financials and right now we're, we are in good shape. So I just wanted to 
put that out there. So you, you've indicated in the past certain things like some of the facilities ones don't track the sort of same pay, pay period one. Um, it might be helpful to sort of pull any major funds like the facilities one to pull out that that as a separate percentage number mm -hmm. so that because the we we know that one has high variability so it's the other ones composite that is keep a closer eye on well that, what we actually do is we did go through and looked at all the supply accounts all the facilities mm -hmm. accounts and the facility accounts actually are spent they're spent almost 50% because a lot of the work is done during the summer. So the fact that they're at spent at 50% and we're not even at overall 25% is a good thing. So we are looking at those other accounts. I understand, but the, the lumpiness of the way their spending goes, mm -hmm. may, I'm saying you, you may want to uh, think about a dashboard type of item that would exclude a lumpy account from your percentage used. Okay. Any other questions? Thank no? you, Catherine. You're welcome. We have superintendent's report. So I passed out the uh, revised enrollment sheet. Um, the report shows the enrollment down six students from last month and down 26 students from last year. Um, you'll remember at the last business meeting we talked about um, the decline in the number of students who were sophomores last year and who are now juniors. Um, and there was a difference of nine students. So I talked with Eamon Keenan and he did a little research. And so out of the nine students, two were away at what we call a semester school, which might be programs such as Chowanki or Knowles where students go, go off campus for a semester. One is doing a full year abroad, four have moved out of state, and two have gone to different high schools. Um, we believe that their families have moved. So that's the explanation for those nine students, that difference. Um, in the budget news, um, Catherine, Aaron, and I met last week to work on the budget timeline. So we're working on the draft and we'll share it with the board when that's complete. Um, Catherine met with the administrative team this morning to discuss the, the process and submitting their budgets. Uh, their proposed budgets will be submitted to Catherine mid-December and she will compile them um, at that point. Uh, I met with Judy Enright to discuss plans for the strategic plan future search process and we are working for, uh, to identify a date for the planning committee to meet with a proposed future search event um, to take place possibly on January 24th and 25th. Uh, so we'll need to, or excuse me, 25th and 26th. We'll need to develop a guiding question for the event so we'll be bringing some ideas back to you for um, discussion on that in the near future. Uh, the first combined town council and school board meeting will take place on October 23rd in the conference room at the firehouse. So we will all have dinner at six o'clock together and then the meeting will start at 6.30. And the planning team is meeting to finalize plans for this meeting on October 19th. We will have a facilitator for that meeting. The calendar committee will be meeting this week to begin work on the, believe it or not, 2019-2020 calendar on Thursday the 11th. The committee is made up of administrators, parents, and teachers who will develop the calendar, and board members, um, who will develop the calendar taking into consideration holidays and the needs of students. So we'll look at, um, we'll look at the calendar that we have for this year and talk about, um, it's a little early, but you know, if it's working or not, what the benefits are. Um, and then we'll look at the blank calendar for next year and um, look to see how that will work in with, um, with our needs. Um, it will probably be a multi-session meeting, so we'll have one meeting and then determine who we need to bring in to, to um, talk to and what information we need, and then we'll meet again to bring all that information together. One of the things that we have to remember is that we have to, um, we can only have, um, I think it's five or six inconsistent days with the other, the other schools and paths. So that's always a challenge um, to try to meet that. We did, we were out of really compliance this year, but um, we did get a, a um, an excused uh, compliance from the state. So, uh, so we are in compliance now. 
Um, Susanna and I, along with Matt Sturgis, I'm a representative from town council on the facilities committee of the school board, will be meeting with a representative from Colby Company, which is the architectural firm that completed the facility study, and we will discuss where we are in the process and possible next steps. On Saturday, October 20th, we're joining uh, with several of the other schools from the Greater Sebago Education Alliance uh, Association to hold a regional substitute job fair in order to recruit new subs. Um, all of the districts are having the same issue with just not having enough substitutes. So the fair will be held from 9 to 11 at Westbrook Middle School on Saturday, October 20th. People who are interested in becoming substitutes will be able to complete applications, um, they'll be able to be fingerprinted right there and interviewed, so it will be the whole process from the beginning to the end, and hopefully we will have some great new subs by the end of that Saturday, so looking, looking forward to that process. That's it, any questions? Lots going on. You said there was a, um, at the um, budget meeting with town council, you said there was gonna be a facilitator. That's for the, the large meeting, not yes. the small one. No, the large Just meeting. Right. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on to new business. Next, we have um, our, the school board, board, school board goals for 2018-2019. May I have a motion? I move we adopt the school board goals for school year 2018-2019. May I have a second? Should we read them? Yes, please. I'm happy to do so. I've got it. <laughs> oh, right ahead. Thank you. So, school board goals number one, develop a new strategic plan. Number two, define and implement a collaborative and proactive budget development process that includes stakeholders such as town council and community members. Number three, participate with the town council in the formation of a committee composed of all stakeholders to fund and finalize the school facility study plan. Implement the findings of the plan by making strategic investments which will modernize and repair aging school buildings and grounds, as well as maximize student learning and safety. Number four, cultivate and leverage community involvement with Cape Elizabeth School District. So for those who don't know how the school um, board approaches um, setting new goals, uh, typically at the beginning of the year, which is what we did this year, um, we come together in a retreat with um, the full board, and this year we had our future new board member, Laura, uh, joining us, and Kathy Stankard along with Donna, and um, we sort of hashed out um, all the possible um, areas we wanted to focus on and we narrowed it down um, to ones that were the majority felt were the strongest and, and most deserving uh, at this point. Um, there, there are only four, but in general, they're, they're broad. Uh, a new strategic plan is a huge deal and we're gonna, as you just heard Donna say, we're gonna begin approaching it um, formally in, in January, uh, but it takes a lot of time to, to form that. Um, interestingly, I just want to point out that um, goal number three, which is references the uh, facility study and the eventual uh, improvement of our buildings, pretty much is word for word what um, the comprehensive planning committee is putting forth to the town council at the end of the year. So those two goals are, are going to be um, identical. That's it. Okay, all those in favor? Next, may I have a motion for number eight? I move we vote to authorize $99,499 lease purchase agreement for one school bus be approved in form presented to this meeting and that a copy of said vote be included in the minutes of this meeting. Do you may have a second? Do we have to change the wording to this exact wording, Catherine? that says I move that no. the vote entitled? No, no okay. it's, it's fine as it is, as long as, it's, as long as the actual vote itself is posted with um, the minutes and stuff. 
it will be fine. I was hoping fine. no one had to read this. No, whole. no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask Heather to do it because she No, it. <laughs> as long as it's posted. I just came up because. If they did, I don't think any of the, the ones they passed previously are the Yeah, yes. exactly. Um, I did want to give you a quick update. Once um, I'd sent, we'd sent this out to uh, for an RFP, it came back that our bus won't be available until mid-December. But that, that was too late to change this. So as you saw, TD Equipment Financing is the lowest uh, provider. And even though uh, having to wait to actually do the lease purchase will increase the interest rate, but only to 3.49%, which is still much less than all the other options. So I, I felt it was, let's continue forward and uh, continue with this lease purchase because TD Bank is is really, their rates are quite, quite good. So I just wanted to give you the update. The bus won't be delivered until mid-December. We were initially hoping for um, mid to um, late October. So that's why we did the bid when we did. Yes. So is the bus um, that will be replaced, I just, it's safe to use? And yes, yes, it's just coming to the end of its lifespan, but Perry's really good about making sure that the, the, the buses that are, um, are older tend to stay around the district and they, they don't, you don't use the older buses for long trips or anything like that. So it's perfectly safe to do the regular routes and stuff. So, but that is a very good question. Elizabeth? I appreciate that question because that was going to be my question, <laughs> having been on a bus that was very old that caught on fire last spring from a different district. <laughs> um, so that's great. My question now is, um, I, in my tenure on the board, it seems like we have a very responsible kind of bus replacement schedule. Mm -hmm. And... Um, is there, and I may be wrong, but I feel like I've heard something about there's a, a state program that um, reimburses school districts who do that kind of on a responsible schedule that if we, after a certain amount of time, buy it, that there's a certain, no, there's nothing, that we get a certain amount of money back toward that purchase? The state does provide some funding for buses. You have to keep, depending on the bus type, there's type bus C, type D. Um, the typical school bus that most people see, you have to keep for 10 years on 125,000 miles. After that point, the state may look at it and go, oh, well, if you wait and you replace that bus, we may give you subsidy, but they have cut back immensely on how much subsidy they provide, so they don't do that much frequently. And then it goes into the EPS formula, so even though they provide some funds, we'd only get 7% of it because of the way it falls in, so. Yeah. Okay. Just thought there might be something, some good news, but no. Sorry. <laughs> Do okay. we know the current age of the bus? The one that we're, um, no, bus. I'm sorry, I don't. I didn't get that from. And the one we're getting supposedly 2019 or 20? Oh, I believe it's a 2020. This one? Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. Already started doing that, I think. Okay, and this is a three-year lease, right? Yes, yes, that's, that's the way we normally, and with, this is a rotation. Every year during the budget process, you'll see that we always have a new three-year lease started because it's best to keep those buses fresh as, as long as we can. Okay. okay. All those in favor? Next, uh, number nine, may I have a motion, please? So, I, I move that we separate um, the item nine. Yep, they are separated. Thank you for pointing that out. So we'll do um, each resolution separately. So we'll begin with, you wanna make a motion for the first one? So, uh, um, sure. Um, sure, what do you do? I, I move that uh, we uh, uh, support the CDS move to public schools uh, MSBA resolution. May I have a second? A second. I second. Any discussion? So just to be clear, this is the motion to support uh, moving programs for three to five year olds to the school system, provided that they are adequately funded by the state. 
And just just so the audience um, at home understands, um, I believe it's just once a year the this association comes together, the Maine um, School Board Association. Um, with various resolutions that have been uh, gone through the association. And this, this year, under number nine, there's a bunch. These are the resolutions that um, will be voted on at the end of the month um, at a delegate's uh, vote, a, the, a vote by the delegates. Um, so just so you know, this is what we're doing. And in October, uh, the end of October, John will be our delegate. So he's looking for guidance from the board right now as to how we would hope he would vote for us. This so. particular one causes, I mean, it says appropriately funded, but um, seeing the type of funding we're receiving at this point from the state, adding two more years of education, I, concerns me, um, you know, so appropriately funded, I would like to see fully funded, <laughs> if, you know, if that's a, a move that we're going to support. I just don't think that that's a fair thing at this point to add on to our tax base here. Which raises a, a good question um, that I think Donna could, could provide some clarification, not only for this resolution, but any other resolutions that, you know, on paper sound good, but when you examine the uh, implications for taxpayers, you may feel differently. So. Sure, and um, the, the Maine School Board Association um, is very active um, in, in Augusta when the legislature is meeting, so the Maine School Board Association really um, works uh, for the to pass the resolutions um, in the legislature. Um, that have been that have been passed by the Maine School Board Association, so they lobby for those those pieces. So, if you if you have a concern about that and don't wish to support that, um, that's fine. Um, it's it's in what this board chooses to support or not to support um, for our delegate moving forward. So. I guess also what I would like clarification on is, so me personally, I, I b believe that this is a, a you know worthwhile goal. I think education should be coming down to the, the younger ages. Um, however, as Kimberly pointed out, appropriately funded has me nervous. So it's mm -hmm. it's not that I mm -hmm. don't value the, the the emotion on the table. It, it's just I don't. One of the huge implications of space. Um, and I know that there have been um, various suggestions about, you know, do the students come here? Do we rent a space? Do they just come for services? So there are a lot of um, questions up in the air about how that would work and what that would look like. It doesn't necessarily mean that all of those students would come and we do a class for them. So, so I, I think I'm going to clarify too that the, the, the three to five year old services that they're talking about is not all three to five year olds. It is the, that is the uh, age at which federal and state funding kick in, particularly for disadvantaged and right. special ed kids. And those are currently handled separately than school districts. And then there's a taught to be a transition to the school based system mm -hmm. at age five or when they begin to attend public schools. So this is a much smaller subset of those. And the funding for them has come predominantly from the federal government. And there is there is a space, con somewhat of a space consideration. It's also a tr transition and personnel um, some consideration. Um, in general, uh, school districts are better set up in terms of the staff they have on hand to deliver these services than the state currently is. So in some respects, it, that may be better. The funding a question aside, um, Again, these are federal government funded, uh, federal government required, and so mo most of the money flows not from the state, but from the, f from the federal government through the state to the districts. So um, I'm, under our way we fund education in Maine, I'm not sure how that will be handled. Um, <laughs> if, it, if it is the sort of t um, federal funding, like some of the title, title funding that we get, it won't be affected by our funding formula as you see the title money that's outside exterior to our budget. So it may not have that same impact. I just had a question. So 
These are, this is a slate that was de delivered to us and we are then going to give our opinions to John and then he yeah. knows how we feel about it. Yes. So, yes. okay. And you, and you can take it under advisement or will you bind yourself to what we, how we vote? Oh, I, I, I think it's important to bind ourselves to, I'm representing the board, not myself. Sure, okay. Yeah. I, anyway, I will still speak for myself, but yeah. I will certainly <laughs> vote according to what the board has said. And I'm happy to speak for the board as well. So one other question I have, Don, I'm sorry, because mm -hmm. I think it's important for me at least to be clear. If I vote my conscience, yeah, I would say yes. Do, so it, it's so early days, is that how I should look at it? Should I look at it in terms of what I believe in or do I have to think of it you know, with the full implications? Well, I think possible? implications to the district are always very important as the board. Um, you know, how is this going to impact the board and you know will the funding be adequate and appropriate um, is always a question that we that we have to ask that you have to ask because it, it will impact yeah. the district so thank you so further either question or clarify at this point these are just resolutions yes. although they refer to items that are proposed to be law and so as we, again, to go back, like I, I agree that I think that the schools are better equipped to serve um, students who have disabilities uh, in that three to five year old population. I witnessed um, in my son's preschool, and, and this, was, this was lucky because these parents happened to go to a preschool who knew to reach out because that doesn't happen everywhere. So that you know they had someone coming in and giving services in preschool which was fantastic and that just doesn't happen everywhere so again on the the philosophical level i agree with this but if it goes into law we have no choice but to do this whether we get the funding or not so that it's a very tricky decision to support or not support some of these because of some of them have very big funding implications. Mm -hmm. This one may not be the biggest. I'm reserving my big talk for a little bit later on. But this does concern me because these are all, these are things that, that get really lobbied for, that, that they lobby our um, state senators to really mm -hmm. take up and, and wave their banner for. And I, I, I hesitate about some of them. And this one is, is tricky to me. So, where I'm coming down as we read it is I feel like the word appropriately funding uh, funded is not strong enough um, for this for, for me as a board member to support mm -hmm. um, I understand what they want to do I think that that's headed in the right direction the wording of this resolution if it is it's going to go into essentially lobbying material that says we want this and and uh, appropriate gets very squishy mm -hmm. um, so that's where I'm sort of coming down. There's also a clarification that I need to ask. Uh, this is basically asking for preschool to be at the school level? No. no. So, so age three year or five year old child can go to school? No. no. The, these are, um, the, the federal law that for special education and some other disadvantaged students begins at age three. Not at school starts at age five. So there's a gap between age three and age five for special ed services in an educational setting. So sometimes they're delivered in the home, sometimes they're delivered in the preschool, sometimes they're delivered. So the, how they're delivered right now is sort of up yeah. to the state. And, and in this case, what it would say is they're going to, um, they're supporting moving that delivery to the school system as they're delivering them to the five-year-olds and up, they would extend that to delivering to three-year-olds and, uh, and, and up within those services. Right. So, so it's not all students. So let me, yeah, let me describe my situation and see if this fits in this picture. Uh, my child basically did not have preschool, did not have daycare, and therefore, because affordability reason, uh, it costs 300 or $400 a week to send a, a child to a daycare. So I was very, very worried when my child was going into uh, preschool that he would be already behind because he didn't have the social skills, he didn't have the English skills, he didn't have the English interaction. And so due to the finance reason, kids like that, parents hold on purposely 
but yet they were worried. The best thing I could provide was provide Kuma, which is across the street, for that child before the school started. So I don't know if this is addressing situations like that or not. No. No. Let's say you, you were at the doctor's office and your doctor, uh, the child, the pediatrician. Yeah. And the pediatrician might say, it sounds like your child has a, a speech impairment or speech okay. delay. And they would hook you up with um, CDS. And CDS would then come and do their own evaluation. And they might, you might, your child would get um, speech therapy. Okay. And the three, four, five-year-old before they're in kindergarten, so you might get speech therapy coming to your house, okay. or am I, I feel like, that's, right. you know, that's, that's just right. a, for okay. instance, there could be other, but, you know, or if your child was in preschool, they might have the speech therapist come to the preschool. And so I think what they're saying is they, uh, this, this resolution is wanting to move all those services, there are so many more, but yeah. I'm just giving that one example around some kind of, um, difficulty or disability, they want to move that into the school departments because, the, and I agree, I think the school departments are probably better equipped and set up to deliver the services, but the, I agree about the word yeah. appropriate being a, a scary word because that those are expensive services. They have a great impact on the budget. They sure do. It's not a huge number of students, not all students, but it's, it can be a very expensive population. Mm -hmm. Deb? May, may I? Yes, yeah, please. I would, uh, <laughs> I would be really, um, really appreciate well, it. Can, can you, you come up the to the mic? So the people on the TV can hear you. <laughs> I just want to share that CDS has been historically underfunded. And as far as I know, I mean, local entitlement, the local entitlement grants do have a small amount of money that can go to three to five year olds. But other than that, I don't know of any other funding pieces that are coming through. One of the things I did want to share with the board is that I had colleagues that were on uh, the group that was looking at this last year and they worked very hard to move this forward. But um, one of the pieces that came up is some of these students at this preschool level or three to five age are actually outplaced at Margaret Murphy or at special purpose private schools. And when the question was, so those just become our responsibility and how will those be funded? And there was absolutely no answer to that. And um, so they, I mean, some schools are, I mean, they access main care, but then the, when you access main care, you uh, trigger seed money and the seed money comes out of your, um, allocations that you receive on a quarterly basis or monthly basis. And then the way the funding formula is set up is schools that access main care right now, that money is backed out. It's seen as a revenue and it's backed out in the six step special education funding formula. So it's actually, there's actually no incentive to bill for main care. So I'm, I'm just not sure there's a lot of concerns. I mean, the space has been one of the big issues that came up, credentialing, because nobody's credentialed to work with these students, so the state has to go through all those pieces. And I just wanted to mention that, that the special purpose private schools, the students that are outplaced would be also become the responsibility of the school districts as well. And Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And remember, if uh, a parent is moving into town, that other places may not have such services. I know it's public schools, but at Cape Elizabeth may be attractive. That parent may have other siblings, other kids who may come to our other schools as well. Whether it's a high school or middle school, so enrollments will increase as well within that reference. Okay. Well, how about the first vote? Those in favor of the resolution. Resolution. I'm sorry. I have one, I have one more quick question. Oh, sure. Sorry. Question, just because it will reflect yeah. how I vote on all of them. Is this may be a foolish question, but is there a way that the MSBA can make one of their resolutions that they attempt to impact the state's funding of our, I mean, the overall funding? And, and these feel like w wonderful, lofty goals, but if we don't have the money that we basically supposed to have for our basic provision of education, these are just pie in the sky. So what's, 
Did, why is that not one of these goals? I don't know that they have that kind of power. <laughs> they don't have. They don't have that power. <laughs> so we're we're just saying we are going to help them. Pr we're we're going to provide our input for their platform and get to say what what we think our priorities are so, in terms of the this uh, list. Yeah, I, I was similarly underwhelmed with the breadth of their resolution goals. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry. No, it, it's it's hard. I think it's a hard thing to be asked to to decide. Mm -hmm. but here we are. We're going to vote. Do you want to vote in favor of the resolution? So the resolution is to support it. I think is what we read it at. Yes. So. Yes. All those in favor? <coughs> All those opposed? I'm going to, um, just for uh, clarity's sake, I'm going to gonna name this one, the one that we just voted on, 9A. It's a bullet point. So it would be 9A. Okay. So moving on to 9B, may I have a motion? Can I make a suggestion? Do, um, as everyone, if everyone's read these, we might want to identify the ones that we actually can just vote on without a lot of discussion, because I think some will require some discussion and others are, are more straightforward. So um, could we just sort of pause and get a straw poll about, about if people really want to discuss, if they want to actually discuss it, then we, that way we can go through them. I think it's better just okay. to go one at a we time. Can, okay. I just think it's too confusing right. otherwise. So let's go for um, 9B. May I have a motion, please? I move to support the following MSBA resolution, school safety. Just let me read the whole thing. <laughs> to support a public school's responsibility to keep children safe the Maine School Board Association advocates the following comprehensive approach. Ongoing risk assessments, not only for active shooter attacks, but other disruptors that could put students or staff at risk. Increased forces focus on social and emotional support, training on early warning signs around student perpetrators of violence. Can I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Hope, no? All those not opposed? Um, or neutral. <laughs> you can abstain. I'm, I'm going to abstain. Okay. okay, next item is 9C. May I have a motion, please? I move that we support the following MSBA resolution, gun-free schools. The Maine School Board Association supports the current state ban on guns, loaded and unloaded on school property, and opposes any legislative attempts to amend that prohibition. The ban is both symbolic and practical. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? This talking about gun on premise by schools or by anybody or by a resource officer too? Let's get the resource officers are allowed to carry. They, yeah. The law doesn't apply to them. It does not apply to them. Okay. Um, all those in favor? Next item 9D. May I have a motion, please? We move to support the following MSBA resolution, proficiency-based diplomas. The Maine School Board Association supports the ongoing work toward the implementation of proficiency-based diploma systems in Maine schools. The work to improve pro proficiency-based systems must be done by educational stakeholders and be in the best interest of all students. I have a second? Second. Sorry. Any discussion? John? So the key part of this to me is the second part of this, which says that the, um, the work to improve those systems have to be done by, should, must be done by educational stakeholders. Um, because what, when we last went down this road, and I, I ended up commenting as a parent um, of a special ed student to the Department of Education, Pro proficiency-based diplomas became something that you actually had three different definitions of what people thought it was doing, okay? The challenge with a diploma is it's a minimum standard. And 
that's actually a very hard concept sometimes for people to grasp what a minimum standard is. Because when you say you want high school, high graduation rates, that's about what your minimum standard is. And then you have people who want certain proficiencies and things that are job readiness and other sorts of um, content and curriculum, which is a very different goal than what a minimum standard is. And then you had other folks who were talking about um, uh, other aspects of what that um, diploma should look like and so what goals it should see. <laughs> so it has to, it doesn't, has less to do with achievement and more to do with minimum standards as well as other aspects. So the last time around, it was so convoluted as to understand uh, all the parties at the table that were pushing for proficiency-based diplomas each meant something entirely different by what they were talking about in a proficiency-based diploma. And you could never square that circle. And the Department of Education, I think, wisely ended up dropping it for the time being. Now, that doesn't mean proficiency-based diplomas don't have a role. It's just that the language and the precision around what that means and what it's actually trying to serve needs to be precise. And I actually think that I do support them, and I do think educators are the right people to think about how to move that forward because um, uh, standards are important, and minimum standards, when you think about trying to get people to graduate high school, are important, and, and that's for all types of students. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Moving on to 9E, please. May I have a motion? Sure. motion. I motion to move the MSBA resolution, special education reform. The main school board association believes the special education system was created by Congress more than 40 years ago it needs to be reviewed and amended on the federal and state level to assure all students are being met. Second. Second, Elizabeth, any discussion? Just, just briefly, this is about that funding for the program we had talked about earlier that needs to be reviewed as well as uh, broadening it so it's not necessarily because it's currently a fail first and then serve system. Um, so there's, there's lots of room for improvement and lots of room to sort of uh, spread out how the, the we as a, a society bear that burden. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, next item, 9F, may I have a motion, please? Somebody? Uh, I move that we support um, the MSBA resolution regarding starting teacher pay and longer school year. The Maine School Board Association supports a law change to lengthen the school year to 180 instructional days and 10 days for professional development because there's not enough time in the current calendar to accomplish all that is needed and required. In conjunction with a longer school year, we also support a law change calling for additional state funding to raise the starting teacher salary to $40,000. We have a second? Second. Any discussion? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Elizabeth, you're chomping at the bit. <laughs> no, I, um, I, I, it, this is another philosophical agreement and practical absolutely no. This conversation has to happen in Cape Elizabeth. I hope that we have conversation about length of school day, about length of school year, about all sorts of things, but in our community, in strategic planning, um, they have huge budget and contractual implications, and I have a grave concern about this becoming law that blankets the state, because this is not one size fits all. It, it, I'm, I'm very worried about this one. Thank you. John? Similarly, one size fits all by naming a flat figure for a teacher's salary is crazy. What you would set as a minimum standard has to be related to what the current labor markets are. And believe me, they're very different up in Washington County versus York County or Cumberland County or different parts of Cumberland County. The numbers you're going to get in Falmouth or Cape or Scarborough are going to be very, very, very different than what you're going to get in Washington County or Arista County. 
So setting a flat figure for the entire state is exactly what you said. It is not a one size fits all. That doesn't mean I don't support you know, higher minimum salaries for teachers. I certainly do. This is a, just a terrible, foolish way to go about getting it. And the idea that you trade that off for calendar also seems to me to be um, a broken concept. Any further discussion? Now, sir? Yeah, well, I'm definitely in favor for this, and I'll outline my reasons. Uh, Ten days, uh, five days more, I guess it's currently 175, right? I think so, yeah. Five days not asking more, 10 days professional development, we are already seeking that individually. And here we are thinking about statewide schools. So even though it may affect us, but we can always complement it as well. Uh, and then I just came from uh, London, and uh, I think they only get six weeks off for the whole school year. And uh, so compared to London or, the, or Europe, our education system is far behind, in my opinion. So I think more days, more professional development, and definitely starting from minimum 40,000 salary, teachers deserves to be paid no matter where they are, the county-wise. But that doesn't mean we have to pay them, we can pay them more as well. So just my opinion, I am going to vote my direction. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you, Nasser. Um, next item, nine, should I have a motion, please? I move that we support the MSBA resolution regarding school attendance at age five. The Maine School Board Association understands how critical early education is to the success of students and believes Maine's current compulsory attendance at age of seven is too high and out of step with the rest of the country. MSBA supports a recommended age of five, which is typical age of kindergarten in the state. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? So they interestingly included some uh, research that contradicted their resolution. Um, and I agree with the research and not the resolution. The research shows that the majority of the country sends, has a law at, to have kids attend kindergarten by age six. And the reason I agree with this is that there are many students that may turn five at the end of August, they may turn five in September, they may turn five at the beginning of October. But under this, if this law went into effect, they would be compelled to go to school. And I think that that is a, there are many situations where a child would be better doing another year in preschool. Um, I don't think this, the research supports that. <laughs> And I think we all have personal stories in our histories and people that we know that's, that seven may be too old, but I think five is too young for some students. Some students just aren't ready at age five. And I don't love the idea of taking that choice away from a family um, who needs to make that choice for their child. I also am concerned that if that law went into effect, that. It, parents understandably so might still make that choice and I, I would support them in making that choice but then we would then have um, a truancy issue which would then turn into a failing school issue possibly. Hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I know a number of people who held their kids and you know, I, I think that people do that for various reasons but I wouldn't want to Take that away. I think six is six is fine. Five too young, maybe, for it to be across the board. Mm -hmm. So the challenge is, we are presented only with the wording they present. I know. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you could give some feedback, John. Yeah. <laughs> well, as as well as to the process by which these are circulated, um, without uh, time for comment, um, as I think in many ways. Uh, what we've discussed tonight are we are actually quite uh, generally aligned with many of the things they seek to do. However, uh, they've drafted wording that is unsupportable. 
Um, similarly, the, the important part of this uh, res uh, resolution is the compulsory part. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's not saying that you can't send your kid to school at five if they're ready and they'll take them. You can't. It's really about the what, is it compulsory? Um, and so, uh, I, I haven't looked in the data in detail, but um, I'm, I'm, my impression is it's a bit mixed on the benefit of, so if you're in a in rich environment, uh, the benefit is certainly mixed. If you're in an impoverished environment, again, it's not, the question is compulsory. If you can send your kid and want to, go ahead. Yes. No, so again, you know which way I'm gonna vote, so. Uh, typically, most parents, both parents work. They suddenly a kid that age to kindergarten anyway. So why not be a school? We're not saying they can't. Yeah. We're saying Send compulsory, them. as in have to. That, so that the parent can't choose to keep them home. So if you were to hold your six-year-old home, yeah. you would be breaking the state law if, oh, if if this resolution were pushed forward and became, or your law, became law. Your five year yes. old. Okay. I, I purposely use six to illustrate the inflexibility of the current <laughs> language. Yeah. All those in favor of resolution 9G as written. All those opposed? Um, item 10, may I have a motion, please? I move we consider to affirm the student educational trip to England, France, Belgium, and Germany on June 24th to July 3rd, 2020, and acknowledge the impact it has on the school district. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? So this is another one of those trips that's really not attached to the club or the school, but it just gets advertised. Correct. And it's not until 2020, it's, it's two, two summers, uh, not next summer, but the summer after, is that Oh, I think that's wrong. I think it's 2019. Sure, do will make that mistake. <laughs> so, I, I, I move that we amend the current motion to say 2019. Is it? I believe it is. Jeff, would you know for sure? Is it? Oh, it is. Yeah. They thought maybe fundraising time. I my motion. Yeah. It doesn't look like there's fundraising for the group, no, but just in, the hope that families yeah. might do it on their own. Okay. Right, I read it. Oh, okay. So All right. I withdraw my motion. What do we do with the, the Greece trip? Do we put them on a hold or for further discussion? What do we do with what? Greece trip, I think they were good. We already, we already approved that okay. last time. Yeah. Acknowledged it. Or Acknowledging. Affirmed and, and acknowledged its impact. But we are not yes. responsible. Okay, all right, 2020. All those in favor of acknowledging and affirming? I, I just want to just. Yeah, I'd like to. Yeah, go, go please. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just want to. I appreciate that it comes to the board because it does it does have a possible impact if we have a, like a ton of snow days and you know the, the te you know, it looks like June 24th or something. So there's really very little attachment to the school for this trip. I um, I just don't love it. It's 3100. I don't know. The the board we're okay. I don't really know what to say about it. I'm just gonna be done. So, <laughs> Wait, Heather, hold on, John. Heather is next. Yeah, I, th I think that we are uh, a board that wants to support all students being able to do all activities, and this is a leap. It's a leap. For, for we go. the cost that it is. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen. I appreciate that we are aware of it, but I have to say that I feel very uncomfortable voting for it, mm -hmm. and not that I don't want it to happen. And um, it's the same as the one to Greece. I think they're amazing opportunities. When I was a Spanish teacher, I myself took students abroad. I think it's an excellent opportunity, but I don't think it's what this board as a whole stands for when 
our charge, or maybe not our charge, but I, th I think all of us, I think it's fair to say, is we're, our aim and our goal is to consider all children in the district, and I think that this does not, and it is nothing against the board, uh, the, the, the trip, or the faculty member, I think it's Ms. Melanson, um, I, I think it's a wonderful trip, and uh, I, I, do we need to, I appreciate knowing about it, but is it something that we have to vote on? It, it has no impact on the school, and I don't, I don't want to take that stand myself. Hope. And it's become clearer than it did during the Greece trip. I think we came to the same conclusion about the Greece trip, and we amended the motion, and Elizabeth had yes. rightly pointed out that we need to know about the impact because of that one was during the school year. It may impact um, attendance and, and teacher availability, if they, if but this one probably won't. So maybe there's a different motion that occurs for these sort of, we want to know about it, that's nice, but we, we say we're, we're acknowledging it. We're not approving it. We're just in it. communication. We, we know about it. Just that we, we know about it. And that's it. it. So maybe it, it needs to be amended to, to reflect the same amendment we made to the Greece language. So I, I believe that, oh, is, that it does reflect the same language yeah. as the Greece trip. Okay. So affirm. The, the, different, the difference, as you're pointing out, it's is to just affirm. Me. Well, to affirm and acknowledge. That was what's in the. Right. In the Greek, that was in the amended mm -hmm. motion. The difference, I don't know if this is significant or not, is that Rather, this happens after school. Right. After Rather school than approving. The year. Mm -hmm. So we're not approving, we're just affirming and acknowledging. Now, sir? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I appreciate Helen's point, but it does say here, I know it says differently, that it's an equal opportunity for to all participants, but if they can afford it. <laughs> so, do you think if there's a, if, if, if they, if they had mentioned that we're taking one or two students on a full scholarship or 50% scholarship, will that be a little bit more valid to you or? Yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't flow into my mission. Like if every sporting event or mock trial or anything of that sort where students are traveling, ever since I've been involved with the board, It's always been presented, yes, this is available to all students. There is support for them to help pay for any child who wants to do this. And I, I believe it creates a separation. Um, you know, I, even, I, I, I don't know why we need to vote on it. I don't even know why we need to vote to affirm something. But I, agree. I mean, why do we need to even vote on it? What, what, what are we voting? That, that we think it's a good So trip. you see it entirely separate from. So if you, I see it as entirely separate. So if we all vote no, they will still go, right? Yeah, yeah I'm not saying not <laughs> so, to go. Yeah. I'm just saying I don't want the responsibility. I want that to be on the people planning this trip to make it the kind of trip they want. And if they want it to be a trip that's $3,100 and there's one scholarship, well then that's their call. If they want to make it a trip, with 50% of the people going get some scholarship fund, that's their call. If they, you know, like my sister-in-law did a trip in another town to go to Spain last year, and she raised, she and the students raised a ton of money to help support kids, that's their call. And I don't want to approve a trip that I don't feel is fair and equal to all kids to be able to have access to. I feel like that is not our job as a school board. I am not saying don't do the trip. I am not saying, you know, don't take students. Do, I think it's a rich experience. But don't put it on us that the school board said it was okay to take this elite trip, because that's what it is. So call a spade a spade. So, but I was gonna suggest a wording change that may help resolve this, because I do think we did identify an issue, an issue that we can, uh, so I'm gonna suggest we, we amend the wording to read, consideration to acknowledge the student educational trip to England, France, Belgium, and Germany, June 24th to July 3rd, 2020, and bear the impact it may have on the district. So what we're basically saying is we know this is happening, it may have an impact on the district, and we're okay with that if it does. 
specifically as we talked around around calendars and snow days and those sorts of things, as well as um, I guess it's also uh, impact it may have in being advertised and promoted in the school. So, your, th so th John, your wording is is fine, but it is still a form. Thus, the school has a field, the superintendent has a sign, the principal has a sign, mm -hmm. and it's made a number of statements below that as well. So. I'm going to follow what you're saying, which is, I don't believe this trip should fill this out. This is not a Cape Elizabeth School Department field trip. I agree. We should not have this. We should not be voting on this. And I appreciate that we were, were we, we tried to muddle our way through the Greece trip. We, we landed somewhere. And I think we're still in progress, which is, we're going to vote on this, and I'm, I'm cool with it. I, I, I appreciate Heather, because I had too many emotions to... Um, speak clearly and you spoke clearly exactly what I wanted to say, so thank you. Um, but I think that we should not, these should not be on our agendas. This should not be voted on in the future. I think it should be in communications. As it's coming up, it's something that the, you know, the principal can make us aware of as it might have an impact that the superintendent is aware of and it's something that can be worked out. But I, I don't want to acknowledge or affirm this. No, sir? So, I know this is not a school year, but there's a teacher involved in this too. And I'm sure the school does not end right away there. She must have some work to do as, afterwards as well. What does that mean? Uh, I know the, the, the students will ask their parents for permission, and Lisa will take the responsibility alone, I guess or the, whatever insurance they're buying that. But if she needs to ask her permission, what, when, does she end, when does she end school officially? During the school year? Right, usually um, the day after the students. Well, if this was on a school-sponsored trip, it would be, she would be totally separate from that. So. No, but I think Nasser's just asking, when, when is it again, in the school year, the last day of, of the teachers? Like if the kids finish on July, June 21st, when do the teachers, when, when's their last day? June 30th, well, whenever the school, the last day of school is, which. No, okay, I'm saying the last yeah. day of school for kids is June 21st, what's the last day for the teachers? Usually it's the next day, depending on what we set the calendar as. Right, right. Mm -hmm. okay, but okay, it's not the end of the month per se. Just no. To, okay. Sometimes, I, like if school ends on a Friday and we have an early release, there have been years that the superintendent didn't feel it was kind, appropriate, or useful to have the teachers come back on the Monday. Like they're, diff but it's not several days after. It's usually it might be the next day, or they might just work the rest of the day or something. So, I, I think you raised a really important point that this is the wrong form. And, and I do and think that, sheet. well, I, I, I don't think there is a form, but I, because I do think that the, the Greece trip and this one as well, they don't come sort of just, you know, they're not, there is a sort of set of standards that's being applied within the school to sort of say, yes, this is what we want to think about doing. Um, but it's not something that should really, like I said, needs our approval. It's sort of the, the form is all, is misapplied. So I guess I would say if you might want to think about, um, and this is really something for guidance for you know, Jeff and the administration, what kinds of trips and things like that will we allow to be promoted in the school, um, even if they're not for everybody, mm -hmm. um, because they are really good opportunities. So as opposed to saying this is something, this looks like a school sponsored, it really has the imprimatur of the should be available for everyone. So um, I guess th that's what I would sort of say is what, what, what are those uh, criteria for those things that we, so if I wanted to get a bunch of people all together to go and do something that was sounded shady, you probably wouldn't let a person advertise that in the side people sign up in the school. So, so I, I guess, uh, you know, it Some would be hel helpful to, be to sort of, even though there's not an approval, Appro board level approval process that there is some sort of standards being applied in terms of what's being promoted in the schools. But we don't currently have that. So with that, I'm actually gonna suggest that we actually just 
table this motion entirely uh, and uh, address an appropriate, we're not that we're disapproving of the trip, but uh, find an appropriate uh, approach to what we will allow to be promoted in our schools for these sorts of trips. Probably in policy. Because <laughs> we always have something to do on policy. So I, I, I've actually moved to table this now. Can I have a second to table? Second. Okay. All right. All those in favor of tabling it, if we have to vote? Okay. Did you second that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, item 11, I have a motion, please. I move we approve the student whitewater rafting trip on October, October, October 12th and 13th, 2019 from the Cape Elizabeth Outing Club. So that's next year. Oh, it is? Right, I thought that was coming right up. Okay, so amend that to 2018. And we better hurry up and approve it so that they can go. <laughs> not a lot of time there. And this is school time, school trip, so. Yeah. <laughs> Second. Any discussion? Yeah. Uh, the $80 for students, is that coming out of the student's pocket, presumably? That comes out of the student's pocket. I believe there might be a fund um, the kids can apply if they can't meet the travel big sales to help raise yeah. funds. Okay. Any discussion? I just want to point out the main difference with this is that this is a uh, school club, mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, funding for it, you know, is, is par partially, if not largely, uh, student paid. But they are our attempts to um, raise money and support kids who can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So any amount is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we. we Let's not put too much on that because we allow kids to go to Hilton Head. The tennis club. We allow kids Agreed. to go to Las Vegas. So it's it's accessible is what I'd like to say then. But even those trips are not necessarily accessible for everybody. So I, I think we have to dis distinguish it that this mm -hmm. is a bona fide school club. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, all those in favor? Aye. Um, next item 12, may I have a motion please? Consideration to approve the student educational fit trip over in the Cape Elizabeth Model UN to Boston, Mass on February 10th, 2019. Is that supposed to? Oh, yeah, February. Mm -hmm. Correct. May I have a second? A second. Any discussion? I have a discussion. You have uh, a discussion? Yes. <laughs> I love the fact that they typed it and it's legible compared to the other one. Yeah. Which is a red pen and a photo copy one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the discussion. Good feedback. It is. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can actually it read make it. A difference. <laughs> yeah. All those in favor? Okay. Moving on. Uh, item 13, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the student educational trip for the Cape Elizabeth Model UN to Boston, Mass on March 22nd to the 24th, 2019. I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Ooh, okay. Item uh, 14, may I have a motion and you can just reference the agenda, please. <laughs> I move we approve the following 2018-19 administrative and athletic extracurricular personnel nominations as listed in our packet. Second. I just want to, Any discussion? I just want to say thank you to all the staff and faculty that step up to make these events happen, these groups, sports and clubs, environmental club, robotics, all the different sport activities. It wouldn't be possible without teachers and staff going the extra mile, so thank you. I know it takes a lot of time. All right, all those in favor? All right. Item 15. No motion required, but uh, may I have a, a reference to it, Elizabeth? 
So, um, a policy committee met and there have been some basically state mandated updates to our wellness policy. Um, uh, we have to. We have had a wellness committee in the past, and what we need to do is have the the um, the establishment of that wellness committee as part of the policy, and um, and make sure that it, it meets at least once a year. That in years past it didn't meet, and then in other years it met frequently. So um, there isn't a lot um, changed about our our wellness policy. Really, just kind of. Updates. There have been there's been a lot of work um, in discussion around that wellness policy. Um, we talked about um, nutrition in particular. That's where that conversation came up. Um, our food services director was there. The school nurse, um, all school nurses were there actually, and um, principal and. Um, discussion around making nutrition ingredients in particular available to all um, parents and students in order for them to make um, better choices um, having to do with either their cultural or um, religious diets or um, health issues. So um, Peter Esposito has um, purchased a new software that allows um, that information to be um, easily accessible by um, parents and students. However, it didn't come preloaded with anything. So he is manually typing in every single recipe that the school department uses, and then it will be available. So um, that was something that came out of policy committee last spring that was important to um, board members as well as parents. So there's language existing in, in the policy that we felt didn't really need to be changed that made reference to that, but in the practical application, we really wanted to call that out. Um, and then discussion went a little bit further around um, federal um, and state <laughs> kind of guidelines and strictures around our food services and, and, and access to um, free and reduced lunch. And so conversation came up around that, around um, the fact that sometimes the very strict rules that are placed upon us actually deter students from accessing the free lunch. And so there's been conversation about possibly not being a part of federal school lunch anymore because of that barrier. So that's, and, and that's why I wanted to kind of have that bigger conversation. It wasn't any, I'm super excited about full plates, full potential, and I think we could all brainstorm together. Um, but it was, it was a neat conversation. We were gonna have Peter actually come tonight. and, and He, he wasn't was able. Come, so just yeah. talk about it. He'll and I think next. you're mentioning high school in particular. Yeah. Not, not all the grades. No, it's very particular to high school. It was interesting that Justin called out the fact that we were something at 48% was like outstanding mm -hmm. for um, participation. That made me feel sad. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess a little bit yay for us that apparently that's outstanding, but that's really a low bar. And how could we all brainstorm and work together that those kids feel okay? I mean, it's really just a lot about making them feel okay about accessing the food that we have on offer and that not calling them out and making them look so different from everyone else. So um, I'm excited to have that conversation. We had a pretty robust, robust conversation in policy, which really didn't have a whole lot to do with policy. So that's where we're at. Thank so, you. May, item 16 may have a motion oh, for I, I, I had some comments on the, so just two comments on the wellness policy. First of all, I actually think it's a really important policy and I'm just delighted to see the progress forward on full, placeful potential. Uh, I'll, I'll say it again, I say it off, sometimes frequently, I would love to see in addition to mental health and nutrition and exercise, sleep added to the wellness policy. It's the, the, the research is overwhelming how much that actually impacts performance. It's one of the few things that high performing districts can do to really make an impact right away, both in terms of safety and in terms of performance. 
Um, I would love to see sleep added as one of the things that's in the wellness policy because if we drive sleep through the wellness policy because it's really a core value, the implementation of that and the implications for calendar and start times and other things will be well received because it's coming from a place that of your values and you can have the discussion about it before you get there rather than um, some sort of administrative imposition. So I would strongly encourage adding sleep to the wellness policy. And the second comment, uh, again, I think this is really important. The wellness policy committee has a sort of report that they produce. I would strongly suggest that in a uh, related um, procedure, that we, we begin to, to, to draft a version of what we report against so people can see what we're doing. I think it's particularly important as we head into this something like full plates, where, what are we gonna measure and how are we gonna know we improve? Um, and so the same thing around those key topics, what do we wanna measure around um, nutrition, around mental health, around so hopefully sleep, around physical activity? So, so we can get a dashboard or sort of some a snapshot of wellness and what we're really working on and what, where we are. Um, so putting something together that actually, you know, if we, if we provide the template, it will get reported on and we'll pay attention to it. So I would strongly urge we consider adding a procedure that is a template for that report or something to go, to go by. And if we need to get outside help to do that, we should, because that, those kinds of reporting are what's gonna drive policy and decisions and discussions going forward. And if we don't have the data, we can't have the discussion. Thank you, John. Um, item 16, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the following policies as presented for second reading, JJIF, Management of Concussion and Other Head Injuries, JJJ, High School Co-Curricular and Extracurricular Activities Eligibility. I have a second? I second. Any discussion? Just a quick refresher, the um, Management of Concussion and Other Head Injuries um, was really um, driven by our athletic trainer and um, school nurse around best practices and, and current protocols. Um, really, and, and the only changes that, that have been made that are substantive is that the, um, it's not just about students in sports, it's about all students because students, um, so it's not just about return to play, but it's about replay, return to play and learn. Um, because students have the um, possibility of getting concussions outside of you know school activities and sports, they, you know you could get a they could get a concussion at home, whatever. So it, it broadens the language. It used to be very focused on you know the coach will do this or the whatever, and it's it's more around staff, not just coaches. And the um, high school co-curricular and extracurricular activities eligibility, if you'll remember, it was really just. Um, kind of making sure that we're aligned with um, the, the current kind of pause button that's been pushed around the habits of work and how they were um, kind of tripping up the system a little bit as far as eligibility. So we're pushing just a pause button to reflect. And the, the changes in the policy really are not changes, but just kind of a, a reversal back to what it was before incorporating the habits of work language. I, I'm sorry, I also would like to note that the policy committee um, took the homework policy back from it the first reading and has decided not to bring it back to the board at this time. Um, we had tried to use an existing homework policy, um, bring in other things from an MSBA sample or update it in some way instead of building it from scratch. And so the policy committee is not bringing it back to the board in hopes to have a larger conversation through strategic planning before we bring it again. Anything? Thank you, Elizabeth and policy committee. Uh, okay, all those in favor? On to item 17, committee reports. <laughs> I reported. <laughs> Check. I reported. Hope has. 
Um, so uh, I wanted to add a little bit to the comments that Jeff has already made about paths, and I did not know that we had doubled our enrollment, but we are at 16, sending 16 students to paths this year. Um, there's 12 boys and four girls. We are in an array of programs. Uh, we have two auto techs, a carpentry, two commercial art, a culinary student, a food services, uh, three food services, two in health, two in landscape, two in plumbing, and one in woodworking. Um, I had a conversation with someone recently about their child and, and she was saying he was getting ready to graduate and he's very interested in going to the Maine Maritime Academy and she had told me how he had this great interest in, in mechanics and machinery and I said, oh, is he, did he go to pass? And she said, no, no, we didn't want to limit his, op his, his options. And I thought, you know, this is a misconception that I think is is broadly accepted that paths is is for when you don't have a, have those four year college aspirations, you don't have you know don't have other options. So I think that's that's a misconception. Um, they gave me some statistics. Actually, 17% of the paths students go on to four year colleges. Um, the 30% uh, go to two year colleges, and then the others go into the workforce, and they're they're well trained and ready to take jobs uh, in the market. Um, and then um, the other thing is they're adding a cybersecurity program. So starting next fall, they're going to be um, offering that program, which is highly, um, you know, a highly um, uh, coveted skill that is you know necessary in the market right now. So anyway, I just want to give a kind of an overview of class. I think it's sort of a um, I don't think there's a, um, a general understanding of all the, the options that are available there. So, Thank you. We can continue to bring attention to it and Absolutely. try to champion it. Yes. So, I, yes, I, I, please, because I, I always like to view it as, as more of the, the maker world of, mm -hmm. rather than a, a, a sort of a vocational school. Like, and all kinds of people across all kinds of incomes, classes, walks of life, education, religion, whatever, make things, do things, you work with their hands. In fact, our, our previous uh, interim superintendent, we talked about this, is he's not only a superintendent, he's also a carpenter, and he said if, if kids trained with him, they'd know fractions. And it has lots of applications across lots of things, and they're lifetime skills, and, and really ought to be more widely supported. I'm delighted to hear that we've doubled our thing and help, help the work to change the image of what they do, because those are lifetime skills. Any requests for future school board meeting agenda items? So I don't usually do this here, but I don't want to forget. <laughs> um, I would love to hear an update um, about the SRO. And I think the, the public would love to hear about it. Um, if Officer Galvin is willing to come and speak for a few minutes and Jeff to just give us a little since it was a, you know, kind of a new, not really a new person in our schools, but a new position. And I, I, I'm at, people have asked, how's that going? And I have to think that it's going well. I, I feel like it's going well, but I'd let, I think. Yeah, let's not wait for crisis for it to come. <laughs> <laughs> let's hear it's going. Yeah. Um, I just want to mention, this is not a, a gender request at this point, but um, in the newsletter, and I just want to state it tonight, um, we are seeking anybody interested in joining the eventual um, committee for the school facility study. Um, so if you're interested, contact myself or anybody at the board and um, we'll build a list. Thank you. I have one thing um, that I, we might be too early in the school year for, but at some point I'd love um, another update on evaluations. I think at the end of last year it was um, felt like our system was a little bulky, um, and I'd, I'd love to hear how that's progressing. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? No? Upcoming meetings. Erin has posted um, one already. The School Board Town Council joint uh, meeting October 23rd, 6.30 at the fire station. Um, Does that actually start at six? Did Donna say that? Dinner. Six is dinner. dinner. Six. Six. Cool to eat with us. So, okay. <laughs> so six is dinner. Six thirty. That's good. But I don't think that dinner's for 
the whole community, so it wasn't. <laughs> right. I don't think so. But I don't. No. But Donna also and I had had a question. Um, calendar committee is like in two days. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thursday. That's right. Um, Heather and Kimberly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then the uh, town comprehensive public forum, the very last one. I can't remember if the last time I mentioned it, I had the updated date. It's, it's October 30th here at 7. So that should be mm -hmm. on your calendars. Thank so you for that. Okay. Uh, the technology committee will be meeting on October 16th at 2.30, Pond Cove uh, Computer Lab. And so I guess I hope to make it because it's the middle of the day. October 16th? Yeah. Policy Committee will meet on Tuesday, October 30th from 3 to 4.15 in the Jordan Conference Room. We will be deleting things. <laughs> it's exciting. We will be bringing things into compliance with law. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's all the, that's what's on the agenda. <laughs> okay, so item twenty, I have a motion. I move the I have a second. I'm all those keeping my hand up. Any discussion? <laughs> all those in favor? Thank you. 